Yep. Says it's now streaming live on YouTube. Right, now you can go. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Annie. Uh, this is a meeting of the council which is being held remotely. Uh, the meeting is being recorded and streamed via YouTube where members of the public are able to watch the meeting. But please note that any comments posted on the chat feed during the recordings of the meeting will not be monitored by the council. A recording of the committee will be available on the council's website following the meeting. All members have been provided with the remote committee guidance note uh, prior to the meeting and uh, major points include all mobile devices should be switched off or set to silent so the meeting is not interrupted by ringtones. Uh, please switch your profile to mute unless you, you are actually speaking. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand so that we are, I am aware that you want to speak. Um, I think on meetings, team meetings, there's a function for that, but I don't think that's available on Zoom. So if you could actually physically raise your hand, I'd be grateful. Uh, for each item, officers will uh, present the report and then the committee will discuss it, after which, if there are any group leaders, deputy group leaders present, which I don't believe there are at the moment, they will be asked if they have any comments to make. Uh, that's it. So first off, apologies for absence. Well, it appears we don't have any because we all seem to be present and correct. Uh, so if I could move on to declarations of interest. Yeah, I think we've got a couple there. Um, Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, um, item number four, the voluntary sector, which we're covering tonight. I'm a, on the board of Motivated Minds. And item seven, our place update report, I was involved in phase one. Thank you, thank you Councillor Lawrence. Did, I think Councillor Sergeant indicated. Yeah. Yes, Chairman. Um, the um, Community Governance Review, I'm Chairman of Knightbridge Parish Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did, did I miss anyone there? No, don't think so. Okay, if we could move on to the minutes of, uh, on pages five to 10 of the agenda. Um, anyone, I mean, it's a long time ago, first of all, the 27th of February. Obviously, an awful lot has happened since then. Uh, but if you could cast your mind back to, the, to that, if there's any, any issues arising out of those minutes or anything, particularly if anything is not correct, uh, if you could indicate, I'd be grateful. OK, can we vote uh, to record those minutes as accurate? Uh, I'm going to have to, sorry, this is a bit tedious. I'm going to have to go through uh, everyone individually. Uh, so, Councillor Gordon. Uh, I vote for. Councillor Holliman. Councillor Holliman. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I think you were muted there for a minute. Councillor Lawrence. Abstain. Councillor Sargent. Abstain. Uh, and I will vote in favour, so that is carried. Uh, again, I find it rather strange, this abstaining business. Councillor Fellows, you forgot Councillor Fellows. Fellows. Sorry, I did. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, thanks, <laughs> Councillor Gordon. Councillor Fellows. I agree with the minutes. Thank you. In which case, they are definitely carried. I do apologise, Councillor Fellows, for, for, for leaving you out there. Uh, <laughs> Right. Have we now got everyone on uh, for the next item, Annie? Yes, we do. Um, Carla, did you want to ch check your video one last time? Um, I have, and I, I really don't know why it's not working, so apologies. I'll just be a blank screen for tonight. Okay, okay Councillor McGowan, yes, that's fine. Okay, well, uh, the next item is uh, about the voluntary sector's experience of coronavirus and more and you know which is important in itself but even more important is looking ahead to recovery and how we work together uh, now i'm not sure who wants to go first uh, but um if if you could indicate I'd, I'd be grateful and i'll hand over the floor to uh, the first presentation from the voluntary sector I'm, I'm happy to go first if that's suitable. I'm... That's absolutely fine. Please do. Uh, obviously, introduce yourself first. 
Yes, my name's Simon Johnson. I'm the reasonably new Chief Officer for Baz and Billerick in Whitford Council for Voluntary Service. Um, I have um, some slides I'd like to share. If I should just work that out. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, I'm very keen to take some questions throughout if you wish, or we can have some questions after. Um, really keen to sort of address any sort of concerns that you may have or any interests you have. <clears throat> so we was um, been deeply involved, obviously, with the response. Um, <clears throat> we recognise that there's been a fantastic sort of response from our sector, and we recognise that 83% of organisations local to us continue to provide services and um, respond to uh, you know, the needs that we had as a community. We've recently serviced, um, we've done that within the first month. <clears throat> Sorry, we've done that within the first month and we've done one, a survey recently about two weeks ago and we've recognized there's a little bit of a decline on what organizations are operational and um, we're looking to investigate why that is, but we would have an assumption that that's to do with um, funding opportunities and um, perhaps the, the need of staffing and the you know, uh, isolation and so on. At this point, I'd like to say a big thank you. We've been involved with the community hub and um, the officers that have been involved that have been absolutely fantastic. And um, the support from Motivated Minds, United in Kind, Active Essex has been tremendous. And our community hub, with, which we've been a part of, has dealt with over 10,000 inquiries and made over 30,000 outbound calls. And I'm sure you all agree that that's, that's an amazing response um, and it's you know, helped the most in need. Um, a lot of people that are categorised as category A, um, and we've delivered hundreds of food parcels, medicine and so on. As you can see here, the rest of the sector have complemented that as well by providing counselling, um, befriending and keeping people informed on their social media accounts and so on. The benefits that our sector has been able to provide is that the response has been extremely quick. Um, I think the sort of power of people has really come into play and we recognise that, you know, people that have been perhaps furloughed from work or unable to work have kind of stepped into different roles and that's enabled our sector to be able to rapidly upscale, which is something that's quite challenging for other types of organisations. Um, you know, I'm sure Carla of Motivated Vines would, would agree that we've gone from perhaps, you know, a handful of volunteers to dozens of volunteers, and it it's really has made a difference. Also, our sector can respond quite um, quickly because of the, um, you know, the decision making processes have been far easier to be able to manage and be able to react and respond to the needs of people. And the access of funding, there's been over 600 million pounds provided by the lottery alone, and there's obviously lots of other funders as well. The access to funding has been sort of sped up and it's been able to sort of make a big impact immediately. Okay, we expect a lot of challenges for the future. Um, a lot of this sort of speedy funding has been um, on a short term basis. So we recognise that the lottery and most funders have had sort of six month agreements and we're quite concerned that when it comes to September, October, November, that a lot of these support mechanisms that are in place now are likely to deplete or reduce. And what we do expect is an increase in need. So we're quite concerned that that might, you know, how that's going to impact our communities and it's something definitely to be aware of. Um, as you can see below at the bottom of this slide, you know, we were already experiencing increased mental health concerns, um, bereavement, domestic violence, and so on. We also expect a lot of the volunteers that have put their hands up to get involved, they're likely to return to work. So the, the rapid sort of increase of workforce is likely to return um, back to sort of normal levels. Now that could be quite low because 65% of regular volunteers have either started to self-isolate or they're perhaps at an age where they perhaps don't feel too comfortable comfortable to um, continue to volunteer. 
So what have we done to support that? So basically we've uh, made sure that our digital offer has been far more strengthened and we've made sure that we've got um, news bulletins that are going out regularly um, and we're developing online forums. We think it's important for our sector to communicate and make sure that the leaders of our sector can also um, share and collaborate to be able to provide the best response we possibly can. Um, one of the most sort of pressing areas was food banks. So we decided that it was important to make sure that food banks essentially got the information and support that they needed to be able to continue with their provisions. We've seen a rapid increase in, in the need. And um, we felt that that was one of the first places to, to really make sure that they've got some security in their future. Now we're not stopping there. We are looking to support other areas of, um, of our sector, um, but we recognize that that was one of the most in need. Um, we are developing forums and the mental health forum is, is being arranged to be um, initiated in the next couple of weeks. And we really wanna make sure that we can provide that support to sectors. We recognized before that we perhaps were saturating funding opportunities. You know, when most people talk about funding, the first word comes to people's mind is the lottery. Um, there's over 8,000 funders. So what we want to do is try and make sure that we're not pushing everyone through one sort of funnel and just sticking with, with one particular funder as it obviously gets saturated, it, it decreases opportunities for organizations to, to carry out the work that they do. So we're trying to make sure that we can provide funding opportunities across the board um, for lots for all the different types of organizations that we have that are more suitable for them, which hopefully reduce sort of competition and, and, and just try and free up the, the opportunity really of providing the services that they want. Now, there's been a massive increase in volunteers. I think I believe we have between five to 700 people locally that put their hand up with the Essex Coronavirus Action Group. And we recognize that this increase for us, is usually around about 100 people a month that put that are new into volunteering each month. So obviously, it's quite a quite a significant increase. So we've had to increase our staffing. And um, we've looked to basically refresh our volunteer offer. So we've recently launched um, a sort of a new branding for that. Um, which is our Baz and Billerick in Wickford Volunteer Network. And with that, very shortly, hopefully in a few weeks, we'll have a new website so that people can navigate themselves to times that are suitable for them and it'll provide a lot more information so that they can get true guidance. We're quite concerned that, um, that you know, support and advice for volunteers themselves is perhaps not as not as obvious. So we really want to sort of have a one-stop shop to be able to make sure that people local to us in, in our borough can have one point, one place to be able to access the information that they need whilst also being connected to you know, our communities and our organisations. Um, with the increase in volunteers, now we don't want that to stop and I'm sure we all agree. So we're trying to look at um, time banking schemes and so on. And we're looking at perhaps a broader offer, which would be our community skill exchange. Now, the idea of that is, is I suppose, it's like favors really. So what we recognize now is this neighborly approach and we wanna make sure that this continues and there's a, there's a way to be able to do that safely. Um, one of our main concerns at the beginning of this was that, you know, DBS checks, criminal checks, um, couldn't be performed because the service basically um, halted throughout this period. Uh, so what we want to do is really try and get that governance back in place and make sure that people are volunteering safely. The people that have put their hands up that want to volunteer that haven't been utilised at the moment, most of the time that's due to these types of checks. So we want to try and get this fast track to make sure that we can get people activated. I think one of the most disappointing things, especially for us, is that if you've put your hand up to help, then you know, you should really be able to have an opportunity of something. And there's been quite a challenge to that. So um, we really are focusing on volunteers at the moment, trying to embed them within our communities. We're looking at ways that they can support our town centre, our travel with the train stations, um, the food banks, and all of the other organisations, counselling. There's so many, obviously, within our sector. Now, we are looking to utilise Essex County Council's um, tribe mobile application. And the idea of this is that people can also service themselves and find um, areas of need for themselves with a mobile app that will have a map and it will display like um, opportunities. And we're really keen to sort of get on board with what Essex are doing and ensure that Bazardon also gets a part of that pie really. And, um, and looking at trying to, you know, spread our 
spread our network essentially you know there's people in, in surrounding areas that may want to volunteer here because they work and it would be a good approach to try and get everybody to uh, really focus in one place and it makes everything accessible by mobile by internet and we're also looking to do um, publications the one thing that we recognize with our volunteer offer is that we perhaps you know we haven't really got the opportunity to be on high street obviously high streets can be quite expensive so to combat that we're trying to have pop-ups and make sure that we're within all of our um, high streets across Basden. And um, we're making sure that we've got publications that are going out that be available at the, the supermarkets, libraries and so on. We feel that that area has been, um, it's quite challenging to sort of think about how you can become more publicly aware. Um, so we're looking to have some billboards hopefully and, and really take a different approach and make sure that you can't miss Basden's volunteer network. Um, we also, obviously, when it comes to after the um, government advice on social isolation and so on and distancing, we're looking at providing social clubs. Now, we recognise there's a successful social group within Pitsy, and we feel that it's a good opportunity to replicate that. I know that obviously bringing people together at the moment isn't really ideal, but we do want to ensure that we can overcome that in the future um, and give people that opportunity to be able to get involved. Now, all of this will also complement our, our members. And the idea is that the publications will be an opportunity for them to advertise themselves for free. And the social groups would be able to um, provide presentations and be able to put some of their um, flyers and leaflets and so on. And we'd also be making sure that we provide DBS services at a, a very low cost and um, to ensure that you know these checks are taken and there'll be a lot of advice and support and guidance to make sure that um, organizer it's quite challenging for an organization to take on volunteers it so we really want to make sure that this onboarding process is easy and that there's um, templates for organizations to be able to use to be able to do this process properly one of the things that we recognize is that volunteers try and get involved with something but it can be a bad experience and it puts them off so we want to really ensure that the experience is good for the organization and for the volunteer. So as you can see, we're quite, we, we are making quite significant changes. And I think we was going to do this really anyway. Um, being quite new, obviously, it felt like we needed to have a refresh and a rebrand. But <clears throat> obviously, the time the timing for us now is essential to try and get this as quick as possible and as supported as possible and ensure that all of our partners and our collaborators basically are on board and um, recognize what we're trying to achieve. Now, I kind of rushed quite through that. I hope you got all the detail. We obviously had quite a challenging task and I've, I've just added this slide last minute. <clears throat> this isn't an exhaustive list, but I just wanted people to recognize that where we represent our organizations and our members um, and this is just a quick snapshot. I'm not sure if people realize, you know, how many boards, how many groups, how many um, organizations that we, we're embedded with and collaborate with. So here's a quick snapshot. There is more. It was quite outstanding when I was thinking about, oh, yeah, I'll go to that meeting, I'll do this and do that. So just to leave you with that for a couple of moments, just so you can see. I'd be very keen to take questions. Simon, thanks very much for that. It's very, uh, very comprehensive. And I know I've kind of snapped through that. If anybody wants to no, no, that, that, that's brilliant. You don't need to apologise, trust me. Um, I, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, though, is um, basically have the three presentations and then we'll throw questions from the councillors at you. Uh, some will be specific to whichever organisation and some will be across the board. Um, but I think from experience, it normally works better that way. Um, okay. Very remiss of me at the outset, I should have said the th three organisations we've got here tonight, the CVS, Citizens Advice and Motivated Minds have done a, an amazing job during the last three months. Um, and, you know, I think it's worth recording that. I don't think there'll be any disagreement about that. But I think the key thing is, and, and Simon, Simon, you touched on a, a number of points there. Um, what what it's about is is not just recognising that, but but making sure we build on that going forward, and we don't let the momentum go. 
uh, and that we find out what worked, what didn't work, and how we can make it better. But if you don't mind, I'll take I'll take. I don't know if Kathy or Carla wants to go next, and then we'll open it up to discussion. But thank you very much. Carla, did you want me to go next? Yeah, that's fine, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen with you, which I'm hoping you'll be seeing shortly. Um, and what you'll see is a report there. And I'm going to go through it. Don't worry, not word for word. So hopefully I won't bore you to tears. Um, but basically to give you an idea of what's been happening in the citizens of the life world for the last few months. So back way back on the 23rd of March, which seems like such a long time ago, we closed, well, suspended our post to post services. So that's across all the locations in Basel and Billericay and Wickford. Um, we moved to delivering services by a non-face-to-face -face channel. So that's telephone, digital channels, email and web chat. And we have all of the staff and some of the volunteers working from home. So about half of our volunteers now are active. What I wanted to do was share with you some key statistics. So I'm hoping that you are now seeing um, a document that says key stats on the left hand side and I'm looking at Annie who's saying she's not seeing it let me just show you hopefully you're seeing it now lovely good I've got a nod so on the left hand side what you've got is the number of clients we've helped so we've helped 1510 clients between the 23rd of March and last Friday they had between them, as you would expect, more than one issue per client, so 3,282 issues. And then the issues are listed in the middle column. I appreciate that might be a wee bit small for everybody to read, but top issue is debt, which probably doesn't come as a surprise. But actually our debt specialists who are funded by the Money and Pension Service are quite quiet at the moment. That's lower than normal. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's they're quiet at the moment. Most of the reasons for that is all of the support packages that are in place at the moment. So creditors are holding off action. There's more money. So there's an extra thousand pound a year if you're on universal credit. Um, and also there's a lot of support. Um, Simon alluded to it earlier about food banks. There's a lot of support with food parcels for people at the moment. So I'm not saying that the debts have gone away, actually the opposite, they're probably getting worse, but people are not necessarily dealing with them at the moment. I'll come more onto that later. Other big issues are, as you would expect, universal credit. So if you listen to the news at the start of lockdown, every day it was about universal credit. We were inundated. We could have worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week and still not dealt with every application for universal credit that came our way. It was crazy busy. Um, the DWP did change policy and some of that meant that universal credit applications went through quite quickly, which helped people get the money they need. Um, and then the third biggest issue there is employment inquiries. Now, that's not the norm for us. There's about a 40% increase in employment inquiries. Again, probably as you would expect, you think about furlough scheme, of course that was new for everybody. And so we were inundated again with inquiries about furlough. If you look on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see the channels. So you see it's primarily by phone, that's our advice line service. That's currently a chargeable telephone number but I'm delighted to announce that with government funding, National Citizens Advice will be making that a free phone number. We don't have a date for that yet, but it's imminent. Um, but you'll also see that there are other channels there in terms of email and web chat. So we're trying to make it as accessible as we can for people. So what I'll then do is just go back to... I'll give you another report to look at. So I'm hoping if I click new share, that you will see a new report. And I'm looking at Annie to see, and she's nodding away. That's great. So you've got a report in front of you that says three months of a global pandemic. Again, that's quite a scary title, isn't it? To think that we're three months into this. 
And don't worry, I'm not going to go through all 10 pages of this, but there's a nice little summary at the start. And this gives you a bit of a, a picture about nationally, but it is reflected locally as well, about what people are looking for when they search on our public website. So with almost 16 million hits on it in a three month period, you can tell it's been a wee bit busy. And if you go back to month one, the most searched for item is coronavirus, no surprise. Month three, so what we're in recently is redundancy. And that's perhaps scary is maybe a word I don't wanna use, but it's almost an indication of what's coming in terms of we are seeing more people who are being made redundant now. Um, I'll scroll briefly through, and you've got some rather snazzy little charts. So if you go through onto page four, you've got a nice colourful chart there, which will look a bit scary actually, but it's about the top hits on the website. So the very top one on the right hand side says being furloughed if you can't work. Again, that wouldn't be a surprise to you that people are searching for that. The bottom one there was cancelling a package holiday. Again, we had quite a lot of consumer issues right at the start with people trying to get their money back. And that's still the case. And then if we scroll right through to page six, you've got the top 25 hits more recently, this kind of last month. And you've got in fact the top five there. And they're all about employment and redundancy. So again, it's perhaps giving you an indication of what is affecting people today, but also what might be looming on the horizon. So let me just go back to my main report. So what I was going to move to now was just to explain to you about the sort of trends of what we were seeing. So we were seeing more full clients, less information and signposting. Again, that's not a surprise because people can get the information off the website themselves. Demand is still high, but manageable. It was manic in April, but it's manageable now. In terms of universal credit and help to claim, whilst I had mentioned earlier that the DWP had changed their policy, we're a little bit concerned that where some of the policies were changed to enable people to get money quickly, which is a good thing, it may open up some problems later on because they were not checking and are still not checking people's income and people's savings. So where in the past they would have asked for evidence, people would normally have brought in that evidence, they're not asking for that at the moment, which for most people won't be a problem but there will be some who may then find they weren't entitled to receive the money and will incur overpayments. And the DWP will ask for evidence at a certain point in time. <laughs> okay, just to give you a little flavour, I gave you four examples and this came from last week. So you had a couple there about employment and somebody on furlough and the employer saying they've got to return to work but they're not going to get any holiday pay for the next year. So this is not actually a furlough issue, it's a term, a statutory term and condition that everybody is entitled to holiday pay. Um, and it just shows you some of the confusion that employers are having at the moment. We also had um, somebody who was given notice, they were on furlough and given notice, we are seeing a lot more of that. Relationship breakdown, so there was an example there of somebody who left their partner, small child, quite a high rental, private rental, and the only income coming into the home is child benefits. So there's obviously an immediate income problem there, a long wrapped up in the debt issues that may occur and also the relationship issues and the family issues there. And then there's a fourth example of a debt issue that we've just started dealing with. So somebody's got multiple debt, large amount of money over 30K, and the added complexity of having multiple charging orders on a mortgage property, which don't make it particularly easy to deal with. So what have we been doing in terms of funding? So a lot of what we do is try and work with a lot of other organisations and get additional funding in to meet demand. Essex County Council have given us additional money to increase capacity. If you read the local echo, you will have thought that the entire award for the whole of Essex came to Basildon and Rochford, 
Um, that wasn't entirely correct. <laughs> we got a proportion of it, as you would expect, because it was shared out amongst the whole of Essex, excluding South and Thurrock. Um, Essex Community Fund, we managed to get some of their emergency COVID-19 funding. It came through really quickly. They were brilliant, which helped with hardware costs to support home working in terms of things like laptops and phones. That was great. We have an agreement with Trussell Trust, the digital referral scheme to their food bank, which is making things a lot easier for us to refer into them. And we're dealing with Basildon and Job Centre's food bank referrals because they're not allowed to email um, and they don't have a digital scheme. Villariki Rotary kindly gave us some additional funding and we have a bespoke telephone service for their residents. And we're working with Villariki Food Bank to try and ensure that the underlying issues for people who are accessing the food bank are addressed. So that's sometimes an issue in that people can become heavily reliant on a food bank but not address the underlying issues. We have a couple more projects in terms of warm homes, which will sound slightly daft in the middle of summer when it's been so nice, but this is a, not just about keeping people in a warm home during the cold weather, it's also about maximising their income, and so we have partners who can do things like insulation and in some extreme cases, replacement of boilers, not for local authority properties though. <laughs> um, we've also just secured some funding from Energy Redress. Um, we're about to launch a fuel voucher scheme. Now this is for vulnerable households who are on a prepayment meter. And we can issue, in the same way they could get a food parcel, we can issue a fuel voucher. Um, there are set rates, £28 for individuals, £49 for families, maximum three per household. We are not allowed to advertise because of the risk of fraud, because I suspect if we did, we'd be inundated. But we will be looking to partners to refer in, like the council and other partners, um, so that we can try and maximise the opportunity to give out this money. We can then, if it's successful, rebid. It's a three month real rolling programme. If it's successful, we rebid for it. Energy redress funding comes from um, fines that the large energy companies are paid. We're also extending our service um, using some of the Essex County Council funding. And so we'll be opening Saturday mornings from the beginning of July. Obviously at the moment that's telephone and digital channels but at least it's an additional service that's out of office hours, which is helpful. The next step, so the, the really difficult part, aren't they, is knowing what's going to happen next. So we have a phased approach to this. So we're considering that the moment is phase one, we're in kind of pretty much full lockdown, no face-to-face -face services. And phase four is the more back to normal face-to-face -face operating. Two and three are the interesting phases in this. So we have, in order to plan for phase two, looked at wanting to open, when I say open face-to-face -face public access points, I don't mean it in the pre-COVID-19 way. So we've got to adhere to obviously all the NHS and the public health guidelines. What we want to do though is try to reintroduce some access points because we feel that there are some vulnerable people out there who are not engaging by a telephone and by digital channels. And so for example, there are some who are coming up to the door of the Basildon Centre on a daily basis. And probably that's gonna be more so now, isn't it? If you think about the shops reopening, people are going to expect some services to open as well. The problem we've got is a lot of the space that we have is not suitable for anything more than single occupancy, i.e. one person not a uh, member of our staff or volunteer seeing a client. So that makes it more challenging. So we're looking at video calling software so that we could have public access points, but keep the staff and volunteers separate from the client so that we adhere to all guidance. So that's what we're working on. We've also reopened up our volunteer recruitment. So I'm very interested in CVS's new volunteer network because that's going be quite helpful as well. That's what I've got. If I can hand back now to you, Councillor McCurry. Thank you very much. Again, really good presentation, a lot of food for thought. Um, some of it, like you say, a little bit worrying. A little bit challenging. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to, to that in a minute when, when I throw it open. 
but thank, thanks very much for that. And again, thank you for all the work you and your organisation and all your volunteers have done. It, it's not gone, gone unnoticed and it is very much appreciated. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it's now, hopefully, Clara's available. Is she, can we see her now or not? Yeah, hopefully. Oh, there you go. There you are. All right. Okay, I'm going to just try and share a screen. Um, I can't see you guys now because I'm looking at this screen, but can you see? You're not missing anything, Carla, don't worry. I can see. <laughs> can, can you see positioning? <laughs> can you see that slide? No. Ah. Hold on, let me go back. Actually, but sometimes, Carla, it takes a couple of seconds to catch yeah. my mind. Okay. It just, because it, it's, I'll share. There you go. Oh, there you Wonderful. go. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, Motivated Minds, we've been working in the borough now for five years. We use an asset-based community development approach. So um, we work with businesses, schools, the public, the NHS, council, housing associations, active Essex. We've got really good um, spread across all sectors, um, across the borough. Um, we have over seven and a half thousand Facebook followers, which is quite good for a local um, uh, group. Um, we have 20, I say the word resilient volunteers, because they've got to the point where they can, when we move, have to move fast and we have to change our operations, um, they have the ability to adapt and not go into, into meltdown. So that was really important for us, uh, for our current positioning. Um, we've recently received funding from the EELDP, which has made a massive difference, and I'll talk about that in a minute, as well as the CCG, Public Health and the Police, Fire and Crime Commission. So that has that is what enabled on in March for us to be able to start building something. Um, obviously, we have the Happy Hub in Eastgate Shopping Centre, um, but we had to close that. Um, as well as our well youth kids clubs and youth clubs across the borough. So we had to close five of them, um, as well as our walk for wellness, which we also ran in three places across the borough. So we stopped all of that activity more or less overnight. Um, we moved our programs online um, onto our team motivated. So we created a safe virtual private group for our customers to come to so we could deliver those sessions that we usually do online in a safe space. So currently we have 190 people that switched over. So I think that's quite, again, quite a good um, a number. We also moved our counselling and befriending services um, to over the phone. Um, so we did that straight away as well. We also reached out to our partners to see what resources would be available if worst case was to happen. So things like business premises, printing, copying, um, other non-profits, what they could help us with. Um, and schools. So within the first couple of weeks, I got buy-in from different schools that we could use their phone lines, their halls, their kitchens, if needed to, to be. We also, Peabody was one of them. So that helped us. And I'll talk to you in a minute about Langdon Food Bank. But it was about ringing everyone that was in my phone book and going, right, OK, if I need you, what can you do to help us? Um, so that was really important. Um, Kirsty O'Callaghan, I've been working with her from County, from Public Health Team, also contacted me very early on and asked me to support the Essex Corona Action Group. So we joined on that and we started getting referrals through. And at the same time, Grant Taylor said, well, Basden Community Hub. Um, so those partnership working that we've built up over the last five years was allowed a phone call to happen and a yes to happen straight away and I think that's really important um, because sometimes 
in the last five years, some of my working has been very much, oh, well, if you send an email and tell us what you want and um, we'll get back to you in a week. And, uh, and it can be very slow as a sort of non-profit organisation to get some things moving. So I think the relationships that we've built both with Basildon Council and Essex County Council to get things moving instantly was uh, fundamental in allowing us to do what we did. Um, both with Basildon Community Hub and the Essex Coronavirus uh, uh, Corona Action Group, um, we were involved with the early troubleshooting. So it was looking at um, where there are gaps and what we could fill. Um, one of the things that we spotted very early on was every town had a functioning food bank, but Langdon. So that's why then I reached out to our partners, um, Peabody and um, set up the Langdon Food Bank, but I'll go into that in a bit more. Um, we started receiving referrals from Basildon Community Hub. That was amazing how quickly um, the, the teams from the council set that up. It was the work that must have gone on really quickly. And I mean, hats off to the um, officers that set this up because the phone lines were set up referrals for bespoke shopping come through to us for mental um, ill health and for out of hours prescriptions so to that today we've got 176 people that we've supported on a weekly basis from that so that um that was really um really important that we did that and, and again our partnership with um Basildon um ambulance service because they did all our out of hours prescriptions because medication certainly controlled meds are really important that they're looked after so um our partnership with them were, was was brilliant how fast that that come about um, and then the Essex Corona Action Group um, gave me um, access to 510 volunteers. So that helped us feed into sorting the 176 people that needed, um, needed support. What I wanted to do very early on uh, and touch wood is still happening is I matched people by postcode. So I was trying to get neighbors to support neighbors because I see that that's how it can go forward easier, that you get to know Dolly at the end of your street because you've offered to volunteer and Dolly, um, Dolly can now stay in touch with you. Um, and actually some of our, some of the people we've matched, oh my God, it's like they've adopted one another. They're like, as soon as this is down, Dolly's coming over for Sunday lunch. And that's what it's about. It's about celebrating our community because I think over the years it's, it's broken down. So it was really important for me that when I was matching those volunteers that it was done by postcodes. Um, the... We also developed um, anxiety booklet um, for adults um, to support people that were struggling because we recognised that there was lots of stuff going on online and everyone's listening to the news. So we made a eight page booklet that um, Basildon Council kindly um, published a thousand copies. So um, some went out to George Hurd and for their deliveries, and then some went to us and we could give out to our, de to our deliveries as well. But as well as we've got the digital version that, could, that we sent to all of our partners. So again, they could share it, it was a nice free resource. Um, because of the success of that, we then developed a five ways to wellbeing activity one for aimed at children. So it could be sat with, you could be sat with parents, like parents and children could go through it, or a teenager could pick it up and it would take them through the five ways to wellbeing. And there'd be different sort of challenges um, and taking them through the practical ways to five ways to wellbeing. So again, that was um, picked up by Basildon Council and they've supported um, the um, publication of a thousand copies. So again, that was really great work. 
Um, we set up the emergency food bank, as I said, in Langdon. Um, as I, uh, as I mentioned, it was the only town it was the only town in the borough at the time that didn't have a functioning food bank. Um, so we saw that gap and we went in and we also looked at the delivery the, the times that the other um, food banks were open and no one was open I think it was a Monday and a Wednesday and a Saturday. So we chose those three days so we're not clashing with anyone. Um, we also um, partnered obviously with Peabody to get the space for free and very kindly a bikers chapter um, do our delivery. So we have about 20 Harleys, Triumphs turn up and they deliver it as a chapter. So um, there is just a big stream going round the borough of motorbikes um, and, th and that's us. <laughs> so um, that was really good. The other thing that I was very passionate about was that the food banks unite and I worked with Simon and um, Simon from CVS, um, Michelle from um, the Basildon Community Development Team, as well as Louise Voice from Active Essex to look at how we can um, work together better. So, for example, now if a referral comes into me, but the people live in Billericay, I would make ref that referral over to Billericay and vice versa. If they get one for Langdon, then it, it comes to us and then it, it helps because there is a food bank in each in each area now. Um, we've received funding very quickly, just as Cathy said, from um, the emergency COVID fund. Um, from Essex and we got 5,000 to support the food bank. We got National Lottery 5,000 to support the food bank, um, Mayor's Fund and then other donations including public donations. We've had about £1,800 and that was filtered into because um, Basildon, uh, the, the Towngate Theatre put a showing of Dick Whittington on and they recommended us as one of the donation points. And that really helps. And it's that sort of partnership working that really does make a difference. Um, we've also had additional money from um, Essex and National Lottery that have allowed us to take on um, more staff, um, which has been, fantastic as of yesterday we received a um, discretionary business grant from the council which has made a significant difference because we are a non-profit organization and we are ultimately a business and we try and always generate our own income and we do that through the shop sales we do that through the youth clubs we do that through a whole handful of ways and we've basically had to stop everything so in terms of if we just went on last year's projections we would have lost about forty-five thousand pound of revenue in this six month period so um, to be supported again by Basildon Council and the Emergency um, Business Fund um, really meant a lot to us. Um, where I see it going in the future, do you know, I don't know. I haven't got a crystal ball, but what I do know is I'm on my toes. I've got a team of um, seven staff now and um, 25 volunteers and we're ready to go with whatever way. We will be opening up our shop um, just for the sales of mental health um, support, therapy, therapeutic um, merchandise um, in July. We can't do programs yet and get people together. We're still doing all that online. We don't have any um, time frame really for that at the moment. Um, because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. I mean, it would be nice that we can start to get all of that open by sort of August, September, September. But we're just we're just happy to go with the flow. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where we are at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's it. But as um, the other guys said, feel free to ask questions and you can pull it out of my brain. So. Thanks very much, Carla. That that was brilliant. And again, 
just like to thank your organization for everything you've done over the last three months i think uh you know you motivated minds have really really stepped up and done a fantastic job and sort of in areas that you wouldn't automatically assume you've been involved with it normally but um you've just got stuck in and done a fantastic job and uh yeah i'm i'm delighted at what, what you've done and the enthusiasm you've got for it and that also you've picked up a little bit of funding here and there particularly for the London food bank which is just a brilliant brilliant uh piece of work so so well well done for that um i am gonna attempt to throw it up open to questions uh so bear with me it's uh trying to see who's indicating sorry oh got councillor fellows yeah councillor fellows yeah thanks uh, uh aiden uh, first before uh asking my question I, I would like to say heartfelt thanks to the the three speakers because they've, they've done phenomenal work and Albaro would be a lot worse off without them and people who are supporting them um and it's you know so necessary and uh, uh yeah so a big well well done um my down to my, my my question um before i go to a question i want to say to to carla uh clara sorry the, the idea of neighbors with neighbors and dolly being invited to so many sunday lunches and, and I say that it's half jokingly, but it's so serious to to get people as much together as possible to, as a, a small support network. Um, I, I think that's a fantastic uh, concept. So well, well done for that one. Um, Thank you. I've got a question for Simon. Um, he mentioned 600 million pound uh, funding um, from the lottery alone national national right that's uh, i was gonna say it is national right okay and roughly how how yes. many how, how how many groups like yourself is that 600 million i, I didn't think it just be for basilin but how, how many groups is that spread across approximately that's a good question um obviously nationally there'd be um you know thousands of organizations right. um essex you know to try and get an idea of essex i suppose it's quite hard to you know, define that with um, the lottery, but if you look at the Essex Community Foundation, they've already contributed a million pounds. I think that was within the first six weeks. Mm -hmm. So to break that down into Basden is quite a challenge. I would assume okay. these figures will start to appear later down the line because we are still in the middle of this kind of process. Um, mm -hmm. For the lottery, for example, it's taking around about six to eight weeks. And, and as you can imagine, you know, we've been in this for three months. There's a lot still going through that process. May I add, um, for National Lottery, we got 52,200. Um, 5,000 were spending on the food bank. The rest went into counselling, into um, food bank staff, into um, organising what we're doing. So we've managed to, 52,000 was for six months. Mm -hmm. So from that, we've managed to recruit four new staff. So, which I think is amazing. So, and we got that, as Simon said, within sort of six weeks. Excellent. And I've, um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, a question to Kathy. She said the uh, biggest uh, inquiries I get nowadays is um, about unemployment. And there's various uh, different uh, sections un underneath that. How are you finding in employers? Are they stepping up to the mark and or... Are there some of them not perhaps being so uh, friendly and generous and sympathetic? <laughs> um, there's a lot of confusion out there. So I think mm. the big employers have got the big support networks around them, haven't they? And so therefore they're less confused, shall we say, and more supportive. I think it's the smaller to medium size who, understandably, there's a lot of confusing changes out there that they've got mm. to get their heads around and they don't necessarily understand all of it. So the type of inquiries we're getting are not necessarily a furlough inquiry. It can be around someone's statutory entitlement. And so it's sometimes providing a help to the individuals. But the Essex County Council funding we've received, um, they want us to own, open up access to small businesses and to self-employed. 
By that, I don't mean going out and becoming a business advice organisation, because obviously there's other organisations that do that. But we do see a lot of people who are individuals who are self-employed or individuals who are running their own company. And of course, they get sometimes a bit confused by the plethora of legislation that comes on board for them to try and understand. So yes, we are working to try and improve capacity to, to help some of those individuals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the answers. Thank you. I think Councillor uh, Lawrence was, was next in line. So, Councillor Lawrence. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, just in response to Councillor Fellows, just to let you know, there's 1,500 community groups across the UK and £30 million as of yesterday has been dished out. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that all the voluntary sector in Basildon have risen to the challenges that they faced. Uh, and it's great to see. Um, the Citizens Advice Bureau um, and Motivated Minds adapting to the changes for the needs of the clients. And as Cathy said, um, there's going to be more changes, more needs uh, and adap adaptations as we go along. And my question really is to Simon, um, because he mentions about funding um, and uh, me being a bit of a funding guru. Um, I know that a lot of um, organisations um, uh, that are reliant on funding um, have had to um, diverse their applications um, as far as funding goes. Um, lots of organisations that have got existing funds have had to um, keep going with their funds. Uh, most of the groups uh, funding organisations like the National Lottery have signed up to a, a national MOU um, where funders have been very flexible with changes to your uh, current grant projects, but also uh, going looking forward, um, most grant funders of now are e everything is wrapped around COVID nineteen applications. Uh, my, so my question is about going forward when we sort of come out of this, uh, and as you you hinted, six months on some of the grant applications, especially the lottery at the moment. Um, is there any plans on doing any fun funding online workshops? four groups in the borough, um, perhaps um, now and perhaps in the future, uh, because my, my fear is, is that as we come out of this um, COVID-19, uh, the money in six, seven months time may not be there. Uh, and you hinted on that earlier. Um, and so are there any uh, funding workshops going forward? So groups like the Citizens Advice Bureau, St Luke's, for example, uh, motivated minds and any other voluntary organisation in the borough uh, can actually learn uh, to, 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 to move forward on this. Yes, um, we're looking to provide a lot more online. Um, just to sort of cover that six month thing, you know, we also recognise that, you know, you, you're only getting funding at the moment if you're dealing with something directly with COVID. Now, if you're not, or have got an organisation that hasn't got that ability, that means that they're generally draining their reserves. Now, we also recognize that a lot of our local organizations work around six month reserves, which really is a real challenging patch. Um, so yes, yeah, so it, it's a top, top priority. Every organization has said to us that they're impacted with um, finance. There's only a few that are generally supported by um, our public services or our, our public sector basically that have and perhaps not so pressure, but we're talking, you know, single figures more or less, perhaps a little bit more than that. So it's it's quite um, a challenging period. We are looking to transfer everything we do online. We're trying to explore more towards networks and forums. Um, and as I said before, we're trying to get a peer network. I think there's a lot to learn from each other. We've got a relatively small team. Um, we have three, 2.2 workers. So you've got... Um, two part-time so we've got small teams so we need to be quite intelligent and clever around that so we are looking to provide um online webinars um, we're also looking to try and get leaders of organizations in our sector to communicate together i think the best thing we can do is to try and ensure that we're not duplicating stuff you know don't get me wrong there is um excessive need in some areas um so there will definitely be it all needs to work in harmony and i think the best way we can do that is to get us talking and and that's one of our most important areas 
but we'll be definitely be doing online webinars and we're planning to do that in the near future. I think it'd be good for our sector to understand what the borough needs to achieve. You know, with um, Kathy, for example, you know, she really can recognize what's pressing now and we can start to have a strategy to, to deal with essentially, you know, mental health, um, as I mentioned before about suicide and so on. You know, these are some real key things that impact lives, you know, in a very short term. And, and, and try and develop a strategy between all of us. Thank I hope you, that covers Thank that. you, Chair. You are pitching, I believe, for um, to be a speaker, Mr. Councillor Lawrence. Yeah, get that hold of me. <laughs> You'd be very welcome. We'd be very keen for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. I'm not actually sure who else indicated, so apologies if, if I missed anyone. So if you want to put your hand up again at this point, if you did. Uh, because I've got a few questions but and observations, but I don't want to jump in before other people have had the opportunity to speak. So if anyone else wants to speak, please indicate now. Councillor Sergeant, was that you indicating? Yeah, okay, thank you. I haven't got any questions, Chairman, but I'd just like to thank very much the organisations for coming along and giving us presentations. I know all of the organisations, I've had involvement with them, and i just just like to say uh, you're doing a good job and uh, I very much enjoy your presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Sergeant. appreciate that. Um, I have got a couple of questions, so, uh, well, sort of question stroke observations, so if you don't mind, uh, I'll go through those uh, and then if anyone else wants to come in afterwards, great. Uh, specifically to Cathy, but it may be that Simon and Carla want to come in as well. Uh, a couple of real concerns for me, and I suspect from what you've said for you as well. The thing about redundancies, obviously, is a big issue, and it's going to become a much bigger issue going forward, because, albeit, you know, to be fair, the government has, has extended the furlough scheme to the end of August, which is great. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, in any way decrying that. But we are now seeing bigger organisations, and you, you may already be aware of this and seeing evidence of this, uh, if they're looking at the consultation processes that involve a lot of people, you're looking at a 45-day consultation process. So basically, I'm hearing anecdotally that some of the bigger organisations are now starting those consultation processes so people will be made redundant at the end of August, beginning of September. So that's a big worry. And so <laughs> uh, obviously problem for you. Uh, so A, have you, do you think you're prepared for what could be an avalanche of inquiries about that? And B, as a council, what can we do that we're not doing to support you with that? And similar but different point, um, the, interesting what you said about debt early on and that kind of going away a little bit uh but what one real concern of mine is that again i think it's the end of august now i may have lost yeah i'm pretty sure it's the end of august the uh issue about no evictions that the, the private landlords and, and others not being allowed to evict till the end of august if that is lifted then and Please God, it won't be, but I suspect it will. Same question. You know, you're going to get an avalanche of inquiries. Are, are you prepared for that? Uh, are you able to deal with that? And what can the council do that it's not doing already? I and mean, obviously the council will have its own policy on evictions, as you can understand, which will be a lot more understanding and sympathetic than probably a lot of private landlords. But we've got to be realistic that this, whether it's the end of August or a bit later, this is going to happen. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded. That's okay. Yeah, it's a complex area, isn't it? And that's why I can understand if your comments and questions are quite long-winded. But if, taking the first one, if you're looking at redundancies, and debt to some extent, I would love to say to you, yes, we're completely prepared for the tsunami that is likely to come. Uh, how can we be prepared in a way for what we don't know how big this is going to be? 
and we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. And that's probably the same from Carla's perspective as well about how people are going to be affected because, of course, everybody who goes through perhaps a redundancy situation or gets themselves into debt, often through no fault of their own, could suffer with anxiety or depression or other issues. So it's almost about sort of, we haven't got a crystal ball. We do think there are going to be huge problems out there. So at the moment for us, it's trying to resource up, but with a bit of a cautious approach to it. So for example, I haven't bid to the lottery. I'm almost parked that with a view to saving it when I need it. Because at the moment, we're coping. Um, so we're busy, but we're coping. Um, the Money and Pension Service increased the debt advice funding over two tranches over about the last 18 months. So there's a good, reliable team there who are trained, got some capacity at the moment, but they're working on preventative measures. So, for example, we introduced a digital tool called Making Every Penny Count. So the idea being that we were trying to get some money saving tips, and that's probably a, a twee word for it, but to try and get some preventative work out there to try and prevent debt problems from escalating and getting worse. Now that's not going to get to everybody, particularly the most vulnerable, but it may help some people and that's the idea at this stage. So what we're trying to do is prevent issues from escalating, resource up as much as possible for what we think will come and so that's things like the Saturday service, the triaging, so that we put everything that's very straightforward through the website first to provide and empower with information, saving those more specialist resources that need more in-depth handholding, the client with the £30,000 worth of debt and you know, lots of um, uh, uh, charging orders where it's more complicated, saving that work so that we can spend more time with those people who need it. It's what do you, as you as a council, what you can do? <laughs> Again, I think it's being supportive of the voluntary sector, which I think you already are. I think it's in terms of looking at the funding that the voluntary sector get, because they are, you know I'm going to say, we're incredibly resourceful, um, but we've got a great volunteer network who provide you with such value for money that actually every pound invested in the voluntary sector generates X number of more pounds for the community. And it's about looking after that community, isn't it, in various different ways that the voluntary sector do and working with our statutory partners to make things better. So I haven't got off the top of my head any exact things that I would like the council to do, but I will endeavour to go away and think about that a little bit more and come back perhaps at a later time with some better answers as to what I'd like you to do. That, that is absolutely fine and I look forward to hearing that um, and, and thank you for your answer which you know I thought made, made a lot of sense. Um, and does, Carol, does, well, may I add to that? Of course well. you may, of course you may. We've um, already um, had some people come to us because of homelessness. Um, and I will say, again, Basel Council have been brilliant. I've spoke to Leslie, Mo Slade, and we've learned the, very quickly the processes of how things work. Um, but we literally have only learned that over the last sort of two, three weeks. So if there's more um, communication between sort of the voluntary sector and the council uh, and how, referrals can be made quickly and how we can maybe speed up some of those processes the, the council they individually they all work so hard your officers they're amazing but i'm sure there's times where they're short team members or they're short resources certainly when it does come to emergency housing um so if i think that could be looked at that might really help us as well because homelessness is going up um and that does have a knock-on effect with mental health so as an example i was supporting someone who was um suicidal and very adamant about that was their decision because they've lost everything over the last eight weeks um and it took working with the mental health team at the hospital and Basel and all to get this gentleman sorted in a very timely manner and we did that but it took a lot of work and 
don't get me wrong now that pathway is made it's going to be easier for motivated minds but there might be other voluntary sector um, organizations that need that to happen um as well and as and for your own officers because i'm sure they must get frustrated at times thanks carla appreciate that um yeah i think you made a fantastic point about homelessness you know and again like a lot of things we've had a reasonably good game up until now we're dealing with that uh there's been support mechanisms in place all the rest of it but there's been no uh evictions or there shouldn't have been anyway um so obviously when that changes that that, that was the point i was trying to make i am fearful yeah. of what will happen then and how how we will cope i mean we've got to obviously do everything we can but it but it's not it's not going to be easy because people are going to be in real financial trouble private land small private landlords in particular this went once they can you know I'm not and that's not a criticism of all private landlords at all but inevitably there's going to be more pressure and yeah we're going to have to we're going to have challenges there to face so yeah thank you for that uh simon did you want to add anything you don't have to um, yeah, as the vice chair on the homeless working group, you know, I'd like to sort of replicate everything that's been said, really. There's been a fantastic response. We was right in the middle of our um, um, Basel emergency night shelter when this began. And we're just about to conclude. Unfortunately, you know, we've had to make some significant changes in that period, which did put a bit of pressure on, the, on, on yourself and the council. And the way it was responded to has been fantastic. You know, immediate response, which is exactly what was needed. And I'd like to say thank you for everyone who's been involved. <clears throat> Cheers, Simon. Appreciate that. I think I've got a couple more points. In fact, actually, I think one of them's for, for you. Well, again, for you, Simon, probably other people, and, and you definitely addressed it. But in terms of volunteers, um, you know, and particularly the NHS sort of uh, inspired volunteer program, again, anecdotally, I hear a lot of people either got nothing to do or very little to do and that's not your fault at all obviously um how do we tap into that well of um mm. you know opportunity and also the thing that i think grant taylor uh described as neighborliness which again you, you you did refer to which is not not anything official not not part of any cvs or or voluntary sector activity but people just being nice to each other and, and, and looking after each other. How do we harness that going forward? It's it's obviously quite a tough challenge, you know, and something that we're sort of thinking about consistently. Um, I suppose in a way, this, and I mean this politely, and I hope it doesn't get out of context, you know, but this pandemic wasn't as pandemic as we expected it to be. You know, we had a response of our scouting network with 300 volunteers that were prepared to go and, you know, um, food parcels and it was a little bit OTT and but but you know it's good to have that caution and all the people that did put themselves forward you know it's, it's absolutely tremendous you know how brave that is um, to keep that and harness that you know I think we need to generate opportunity you know and an appropriate opportunity um, so it's not re replicating perhaps jobs or paid work but you know stuff, stuff that complements our borough um, so we're in talks with uh, Network Round Volunteer Matters one of our national um, sort of stakeholders and um, to try and embed volunteers to, um, to support people journeying um, we'd like to do the same with our high street and look at inclusive high streets um, and we'd like to try and have these roles to continue for the future I think I think we'd all agree and I mean this also politely you know a lot of the things that we've been trying to achieve possibly for decades has happened in a couple of months um, the, the response with neighbours has been amazing and, and we'd really want to keep that the, the fear and the concern i have is not to cause a blocker but to ensure that the beneficiaries are safe and that you know no one's really taken advantage of and i know it's a very small sort of amount of cases that that's potential for but really it's about making sure that there's a central point for guidance and support and then we turn the organizations that we support and, and even some businesses hopefully will be able to provide opportunities for us to be able to you know in some way become an agency and and try and match people and match things together with their desires 
Now, we also recognise, you know, there's probably more people at the moment than opportunity. So we're also looking for funding individual projects to try and get people engaged and to try and do things that's suitable for them. But the one thing I feel that Basden lacks is what we term as like one-off opportunities. Some of these people just want to, you know, help out for a week or help out for a month and then go back into their world. Now, we want to try and keep that bug and, and get people to... You know, contribute perhaps to a local hall, community hall, um, uh, an elderly home, um, and mainly one of the key things for us is about our environment. You know, before this, we've had some significant changes about carbon reduction and so on, and we are exploring at the moment with um, Grant Taylor, head of culture, to look at how how can we get volunteers engaged with with the environment because obviously we've got some challenges right now with um, the distancing. So we feel that if we can get people outdoors, it's good. You know, it helps with the mental health challenges and pressures that are there at the moment. And we can keep a safe distance in our, in, within our nature. So we think about this daily. We're looking, we're submitting applications ourselves, which is reasonably unique for a CVS because um, we're very conscious to not be competitive with our members. Um, and we're really trying to encourage our members to try and feed all of these opportunities into one place so we can really get, you know match people um and as you can imagine that's quite a challenge um so hopefully we can do that successfully and you know we know that some people are going to go back to work but we feel that there's going to be quite a large portion we, we're averaging about 20 to 30 percent i think we was already low um in the scheme of volunteering nationally within basildon and I, i've always had a passion to try and ensure that people have an opportunity that suits them and I think that's really what it what it's about. So lots of like everyone can donate their time, and some people can't donate money, and it's that's what makes it far more appealing. So um, we're really excited, and I think you can see that with the volunteer network and the rebranding. You know, we recognise that we need to be in front of people's faces. So we are talking about you know perhaps some signage on roundabouts, um, so that people really can't miss us and can't miss the opportunity, and and to ensure that. The organisations uh, benefit from that that we support. Thank you, Simon. Brilliant. Um, anyone else? So I'm just mindful that um, Councillor Holliman and Councillor Gordon haven't yet said anything, but you don't have to. Uh, but it's just it's difficult, you know, logistically a bit difficult to see when people want to say anything. So if you now is your moment. If you want it, if not, that's fine. No, just really acknowledgement and uh, thanks to our voluntary sector for all the hard work they've been doing. I don't, you know, I usually have a reputation for uh, talking for England and asking copious questions on this committee. Um, sure. So that, I know, surely not. So that must go, that says a lot about um, the quality of the work that's that's gone on, the fact that I don't have much to say. And so, <laughs> so my lack of contribution should speak volumes. It does. Thank you. OK, then. Uh, th thanks very much. Uh, so unless anyone wants to come back in and no one's indicating as far as I can see, um, then I'd just like to thank uh, uh, the three people involved for the presentations, the organisations that they represent, all of their volunteers, uh, they really have done an amazing job over the last three months and as I've been commenting on working closely with officers who have also done an amazing job <coughs> all I would say is um, we wouldn't have wanted this situation no one would and you know we have lost people in the borough um, and nationwide and we shouldn't lose track of that um, but it could have been a lot worse locally without the effort uh, and work that's been put in by the voluntary sector working so closely with the council uh, and I'm immensely grateful. I'm also mindful we've got a lot of challenges going forward so we've got to keep the dialogue going. We've got to make sure that we carry on working as well as we have and in fact better because from an economic sociological point of view i think there's some big challenges to come ahead but i think we've learned a lot and hopefully we'll do even better going forward so thank you very much uh simon kathy and carla um 
you, you are in the fortunate position now of being able to leave the meeting. And I don't know if you're interested, but there's a football game going on that just started five <laughs> minutes ago that may have been of some interest. So I'll try to crack through the rest of the meeting as quickly as possible, but I'm not sure I'll manage it. But anyway, thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank Bye. you for having us. Thank you very oh, much. Pleasure. Okay. pleasure. Take care. I'd like to stay if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you're more than welcome. It's local delivery pilot. That, um, of course, Simon. You, you're very welcome. No, Thank good point. Thank you. See, enthusiasm. We don't get this so often. It's great. <laughs> what do you mean, Councillor McGarry? I'm always enthusiastic <laughs> about the committee. I'm just wondering in that case, then, if, if Grant and Paul wouldn't mind if we move to local delivery pilot next and bump community govern uh, governance down one. Do you mind, Paul? No, no problem at all. Yeah, you'll have to miss a bit of the game now, won't you? Well, yes. I will hold it again, you Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, in that case, uh, Mr Taylor, can you give us your update on the local delivery pilot, please? Y yes, I can, of course. So, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, this is um, uh, probably, I think, the third or fourth time I've been back to committee um, to discuss uh, the progress of the local delivery pilot here in Basildon. Um, I won't bore people, but just to remind everyone, so the LDPs um, uh, is funding from Sport England that Basildon's part of the Essex wide bid. We've been lucky enough to be chosen as one of the very few places in the country that's looking at uh, how we can reduce inequalities and barriers to specifically to physical activity through uh, changing the system and introducing new ways of working. In essence, how do we hardwire physical activity into almost anything? So as uh, without the traditional focus on buying bats balls and building swimming pools because we know the benefits of uh activity to people's um health um physical or mental are, are hugely important um so much so that what we've seen um every day on the tv for three months now is uh the prime minister or one of his cabinet or the chief medical officer or one of his colleagues telling us that physical physical activity is incredibly important and people should be out doing it daily or as much as they can now as long as you're doing it safely so i think that's been that's been a very welcome uh, message to hear on our tv screens uh, and radios every day so the focus of the um, essex ldp is to test uh, through uh, these interventions how to increase activity in basil and colchester and tendering which are the pilot areas of essex and then look to scale up and replicate that across essex and, and further afield so tonight's report um, is really just for noting, um, by the way, um, but obviously I'll be happy to take any um, questions at the end. Um, so the outcomes of the LDP uh, here in Basildon um, are to increase physical activity. Um, and we're in particular looking to target people who currently do under 30 minutes activity per week and who live in the most um, deprived communities. So with that, we're focusing on those areas that are in the deciles one to four of the indices of mass deprivation. Um, there are pockets of that um, throughout our borough, um, although predominantly they are concentrated south of the 127. Yeah, we're also looking to achieve wider social and economic outcomes, for instance, the stronger, healthier, more cohesive communities. Um, and what you've heard from uh, Kathy, Simon and Carla, um, this evening who uh, have all been partners to uh, to some degree with this work is very much the basis of of where we, we are looking for the LDSP to, to, to work in uh, that space um, to occupy the same as as the work that they've been discussing tonight and I think you noticed that a number of partners actually spoke about about the LDP and the support and the work that that they're embedded in which I think proves we're not focusing on those uh, sporty sport type people that you know understand that what you know we've got their whistle and their tracksuit and their trainers and don't really understand why anyone's not like them which is obviously part of the problem sometimes uh, we're getting people physically active um we've also been looking to achieve a uh, transformational change so um how do we get a shared vision among all of the system leaders all of the different system uh, partners where we can ensure that physical activity is at the heart of their thinking um in the way that they, they work so that's about perhaps realigning our, our budgets to, to, to make more um, use of um, the, our resources together um, and therefore building a, a robust evidence base that will enable us to replicate this um, at scale. 
There are three areas um, you would have heard previously that we're looking to um, that we're mostly looking to support in in the geog geographic areas I've mentioned. Um, so they're families with dependent children, older people, and those living with poor mental health. Um, so that's just a bit of a reminder as to where we were. Oh, my mouse has stopped working. That's not good. Um, Can you still hear me? Sorry, I've lost. Can I get a nod? Can someone yeah, hear no, me still? Can, can hear you now, Grant. We did lose you for a minute, but can hear you now. Oh, no. Breaking up a little bit. There's more like 10 oh, seconds. You can. I, guess good. I can't seem to move my screen, so I thought there was something wrong. You can't. Oh, you did. Oh, OK. Sorry about that. I, I, I don't know how much you, you missed. Apologies for that. I. I only realised when I couldn't move my screen anymore, so I'm not quite certain what no. happened now. Only a few, few seconds. seconds. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, just to update a little bit of progress to date. Um, so our implementation group, which is made up of the system leaders that, um, that, that, that form that, of which um, Simon uh, is representative on behalf of the voluntary sector, um, has uh, was launched in November um, this year. It's chaired. Uh, it's got three chairs, um, which shows I think that the importance of this is, is our chief executive uh, Scott Logan, uh, alongside William Guy, who is the head of transformation at the Basildon Brentwood CCG, and uh, Steve Mitchell, who is an active Essex board member and the chairman of Active Basildon. Um, we are working with as many multi-agency partners as we can on that, from education to workplaces, from health to the environment, um, and uh, education and everything kind of in between we've been trying to get partners um, together for that the police force are on it the fire service and it's been it's been really really positive on the first meeting we set up a series of what we called 80 day challenges so we agreed that we needed to do some real fundamental work at the beginning now as a new partnership that was going to be leading this agenda locally um, and set ourselves a bit of a task and that's been the, the flavor of how we've moved forward really so that those first 80 days we um, needed to create a, a joint vision for the group um, and you would have seen in enclosure number one what what came out of that um from that co-production of, of partners working together which i think is really really um postcards and and we're really clear that partners need to have them on at all necessary um, because it's really important that wherever people are going whatever meetings they're in they've got the LDP and 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 the important agenda in mind for how they're going to influence this um it's such an important agenda for people's health well-being um and, and mental health of course um we also developed four commissions we called them so almost uh groups that were going to go away and do much of ever on four key areas on how we worked to unlock the opportunities within the education sector now that's not necessarily or perhaps not at all about PE but how do we use education um, as a as a facility and as a um, an opportunity with our schools places where mums dads nans granddads aunts and uncles flock to twice a day trusted places in the hearts of the communities that we care about how do we use that space and those trusted places to be able to drive activity we also know that schools are offer fantastic resources both inside and outside for communities to be able to, to stay active safely so that was a really really important part that's led by by steve mitchell the head of um uh, active basildon alongside uh, liz keeble who is the head of uh, vange school uh, we also had um active environments which is looking at how we use our natural resources at um, our parks and open spaces but also the way we design our spaces and our places so as we ensure that being active is the easier option i think we've lost grant there for momentarily Grant, you appear to have frozen. Annie, is it just me or has 
can anyone yeah no his screen has frozen so i i don't know if um you maybe wanted to ask if uh, i don't i think he's actually come out and he's going to come back in again okay. but well let's give it a minute then yeah okay thank you sorry about this it's okay mr chairman would it help on bandwidth issues perhaps if we all uh, blocked our our video so that we only see grant and yourself it's if 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 councillors can keep their cameras on and then all officers are, are keeping their um their okay. Okay. sound muted and also their their video off. No, you, you're right, councillor fellows. It certainly wouldn't do any harm because we've got a lot of people on on the meeting at the moment. So yeah, that might might be a way of doing it. But anyway, hope hopefully it'll come back in and it'll all be good. Uh, last night housing communities when he uh, muted his own video when Grant muted his own video feed it improved the connection but he's back hello grant you're muted still i am apologize i have no idea when i left i was i was only i was going and then something started swirling around i'm apologize i don't know what's you were happening in flow there, grant. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry i, I have no idea why um um <laughs> I'm wondering if I take my screen off, whether that whether that will help. It could help, possibly. It did. It made a difference last night, Grant. Uh, yeah, oh. uh, apologies, Let's everyone. Let's give it a go. No, no, no. Give it a go. Okay. Um, can anyone give me a clue where I was? Because I, I, I probably said something very insightful after you, after I left. It was probably groundbreaking, but I can't think what it was. Yeah, Grant, you, just, you just mentioned four commissions. Thank you very much, Councillor. That's very kind. Okay. So um, yes, so the, so the four commissions had had had, um, had been working. So they were education skills, active environments, workplace health, and social prescribing, um, which was led, um, which is led by um, William Guy from uh, the CCG. Um, one of the other eighty-day challenges that was set was to set up a virtual platform. Um, a basically, a, um, a, it seems seems like we were ahead of the curve. A virtual space, in essence, where um, partners could come, meet, discuss, share ideas, and the, and the like. So these were these were the three kind of big eighty day challenges that were set up uh, at the start. I'm pleased to say that the implementation group obviously um, adopted that that vision, which, as I said, is part of uh, which is the enclosure. Um, today and the commissions have been working and in the moment I'm going to talk about some of the investment proposals and investment work that has come through those commissions um, so the way it would work is that in, in the commissions go out and work and they, they, they work together they co-produce and come up with ideas for how funding could 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 be um, could be spent to make the biggest difference. Uh, it could be funding. It could be advocating on behalf of groups. It could be um, it, it could be uh, say aligning existing budgets. Where 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 it's not all about just 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 throwing cash at things. Um, and the, the virtual platform is soon to launch, um, hopefully for the next uh, implementation group, which we are expecting to be in the next uh, month to six weeks, hopefully. So um, looking at the investments that have been made since we last met, um, a community chest was launched, which is principally for those micro grants under two and a half thousand pounds. This is about how we can quickly get funding into the hands of people with good ideas. So small investment proposals with, without huge amounts of um, governance, which chases people away, just about actually how we trust people and how we back them and we've seen all sorts of unusual suspects applying for this money um, and I think that's been one of the real real powerful aspects of it um, small church groups um, small um, groups that are working with BAME communities um, uh, sports clubs um, and so much more and also just give people just a chance to test something and we've been really clear that with the LDP we've got quite a um, an appetite for um for innovation so if you've got that idea that you always thought this would help but no but you always thought how's it going to fit in with funding i think what's really good about the ldp is we'll work with you on it we, we won't we won't ask you to fill a form out and then send you another 10 page form at the end of it and and and, and drill you down to how you got there we actually want to work with you throughout it so as we can learn as well and we can support and help so we've We've been, we've been able to be a, do a bit more um, innovative um, funding through this. Um, 
apart from that, there's a number of investments that are over that two and a half uh, thousand pounds that we've been, say, co-creating through our work with the implementation group and the commissions. So just to give you a flavour of some of these, and some of these are um, have been curtailed because of what's happened over the last three months, I have to say, which has been a real shame. This report was due to come um, just before um, the, the um, coronavirus issue um, reared its head and it would have been, uh, and perhaps I'd now would have been at a stage to report back on, on, on the, the, this being um, uh, activated. So we're working um, to um, upskill um, and promote physical activity to our GPs, working with Dr. William Bird, who is a uh, really preeminent um, GP in the physical activity field, um, a bit, if I'm allowed to say, a bit of a rock star um, GP that, that, that the, the that all GPs listen to, and he has written Public Health England's guides to physical activity for for GP practitioners. So we've been doing some bespoke work with him to better train um, at our, lo our local um, uh, primary care networks, which is really really positive. Um, he's he's met with them two or three times, and we're looking to bring it online now, so as we can carry on that work. Um, we um, have also um, been working with an organisation called Street Tag. Street Tag look to incentivise um physical activity in our parks open spaces and streets by using uh, virtual tags um, which people collect via an app um, and they compete in teams and 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 uh, they they get points for collecting apps and points make prizes which can be spent locally um whether that is in cinema vouchers whether that is in um access to the gyms and stuff or, or pending all these things being open with social uh, distancing in mind um and the like now we've been really really keen to work with street tag in relation to um the new world and we've, we've acted very quickly on this um what I'm talking about that is, is uh, I, I talk about myself. I put myself up as a case study. I was someone that would get, that would walk to the tr train station, get the train, get off the train, walk to work, and probably would do 30 to 40 minutes walking a day. Um, not what I'd call um, exercise, but um, inadvertent exercise, I guess. Um, exercise by stealth. Now, it took me probably two weeks to realise um, that I'd stopped doing any exercise, really, because I, I kind of just rolled out of bed, sat, went downstairs, put the coffee on, and then started work. Um, and I think there's lots of people like that. So although we've seen lots of positives about people's activity during this period, I think on, on the same basis, there's lots of people that have lost that. So we look working with Street Tag to create a power hour with this, which will in essence give people double points if they if, on their lunch hours. So we are trying to entice our workforce um, up and down the, 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 the borough to get out and, and actually participate in physical activity with them and their family um, individually or with, or with their family, which I think is really, really important. One of the other things we're looking at doing at Street Tag is it, it offers us a chance to, where we, where we create these virtual tags, to again, double, treble, quadruple the points where we want to incentivize people to be so if we were to do um uh, one of our discale can festivals where we are trying to help support um women um to become more physically active we could we could quadruple the points there if we wanted to promote the, the great work that basil and pride does maybe we could put quadruple points on that day to drive people there maybe it's about a consultation we're doing maybe and maybe it, sometimes it's a, it, it, it could be something that derives an income for the local um, voluntary um, sports sector, whereby the um, private sector might want to buy um, some some points for perhaps an opening of their new um, shoe shop or, or, or the like. And if they pay for that, then we can put the money back into grassroots sport. So all of these things are options that I think are uh, using digital innovation as a way to get people more active and to support um, our local um community voluntary and sports sector. One of the last things I wanted to talk about was we've been doing some work with partners across the borough on um, what Carla was talking about earlier, our asset-based community development work. Um, so we've been working with a fantastic organization called Nurture Development, who are preeminent leaders in, in this work and ha having seen partners from across the sectors come together to train whether that was from the statutory sectors um, from housing associations from colleagues from the voluntary sector all coming together what came from it was a, a, a realization that there was a real need for something like a community involvement network a place where all of the community workers the community development workers whether they're from a housing association from a council from a faith group from asda or tesco or for any of the places that are really directly working to support communities how do they come together share ideas work out how they can make more of coming of working together and so we're creating this community involvement network which will 
work fantastic with LDP, but we expected to do something bigger and wider than that. Now, Swan Housing, one of our partners, have, have agreed to lead on this. So it's not always about the council leading on things, which I think is really, really important and a, and a real key message of the LDP and about how we distribute that, that leadership. So they're going to be leading this. We're really keen to create some kind of partnership strategy for our community work. Um, that, that will come from this. And I think that's a really exciting um, next step that we're looking to do. Um, of course, so many of the partners from the LDP, from the implementation group, from the commissions, from the people that will make up the community involvement network have been the partners that have been running the community hub in Basildon for coronavirus. So it was, I heard about three times in the first week, thank God for the LDP when we were setting up the 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 community hub because so many people knew each other through that work and i think that put us uh, to use a sporting analogy you know a little bit we, we we had a little bit of a head start on on, on others because of that we we wasn't starting from 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 scratch we knew what people were doing we we built that trust we across all of us and we were able to act very very quickly as as carla referenced um so just moving on very quickly, um, it's, since we've last met, we've had the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and Sport England come to visit Basildon as one of the exemplars of this work. Um, that was really great to introduce him to strategic leaders, to the com to the commissioners locally, but also to the grassroots community um, delivery um, partners um, that we're working with as well. So they visited the Happy Hub, um, they visited um, uh, Sport for Confidence and did some fantastic work on, to, to to learn about Basel and it was a really really good day to have the head of sport from from the DCMS come down and um, real strategic leaders from Sport England. That was followed only a couple of weeks later when Tim Hollingsworth the chief executive of Sport England came to Basel and also after what he'd heard. So it's really really important that we recognise that Basel is being seen as um, uh, an important partner an important player in, these, in this national agenda um, and recognising the work that's going on here not not solely at Basildon Council, but across the partnerships, across the people you heard from today, from Kathy, from, from Carla, from Simon, but from so many other organisations, from Sociability, from the Craig Tyler Trust, from, from Basis, from so many more. And I think that's really worth recognising of the fantastic work that's happening across our CCG, working with our hospital. Um, that is also part of it, working with many of our, uh, our uh, private sector uh, partners also. So finally, apologies, um, rambling on. Next steps, we'll be launching that SharePoint, that that, that shared um, uh, place where that bumping space, as it were, where partners will be able to come together and uh, and plan from an implementation group point of view. We will be getting the community involvement network up and running. It did have a date. It was something like the 26th of March. It got cancelled for obvious reasons, but we're now looking, we've got a meeting next Friday about how we're going to bring that back, uh, but using um, virtual methods to do so. And I'm really pleased to say that Street Tag, I was mentioning earlier, will launch in Basildon next week. Um, we will be doing the press for that. Um, Scott Logan will be will be supporting um, with that as well as many partners as possible. And you'll pl please see that. Please download the app when you'll see that, that, that all of the comms that come out for that. We're focusing first on seven parks in our borough, specifically focusing on those areas where we, of um, indices of math deprivation one to four. Um, but what people can download the apps and can and can put in their own tags. So we want this to spread as far and wide as possible across our borough. Um, that's it. Um, sorry um, for me breaking up. Um, any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much, Grant. Um, yeah, I've seen a couple of people indicating already. Um, just couple of things I'd like to say. Uh, one, referring back to our last item, and I'm sure everyone would echo this, uh, a lot of people were involved with the community hub, but you've had a massive input and it has been a you know real success and uh, just want to appreciate, express our appreciation. I think it was Councillor Lawrence first, uh, mm -hmm. so I'll go over to him. Hi Grant, I um, just want to ask you uh, what changes the LDP has had to make with the COVID-19 and what challenges you may have faced? Yeah, it's a, it, well, a lot and a lot of challenges. So everything we thought we were about to do um, um, got curtailed. And as, as you know, um, Councillor, for, like for most people, the we went into something which was quite different for many of the partners that were working on the LDP. We went into a bit of a, um, a command and control um, pr approach very, very quickly because the first thing we needed to do um, was create a community hub where 
no one vulnerable was going to go without food or medication and where we would normally do this kind of approach with you know holding you know not doing two people and holding and, and and helping people with a guided hand it was very clear that we need to operate in a very different way at least initially just to make sure that we got the name we got their addresses and we were absolutely clear that that um, their basic needs were, were catered for um that has started to change as we move forward. As the shops have, have, have been restocked, it seems a long time ago now when we saw those images where you couldn't actually go into a shop and buy something now that we've got lots of non-essential non stores opening. So um, the that command and control aspect of it has, um, has, has dissipated to some degree and we've now been able to start working about how through through the LDP, how the, how the hub, we are going to support some of those that perhaps haven't got the same freedoms with the slow easing of lockdown that others of us um, have. So there is a blurred line, I think, with the LDP and the community hub on some of this work. Um, so we've we've started to think about how we use digital much better to be able to get into people's homes. Now we know that there is all any plethora of ways you can participate in a fitness class. So great power to Joe Wicks to active. Active Essex and all the work they're doing there, there wasn't really a need for us to step into that space. Um, and um, so we, 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 we've, we've been signposting people to that good work. What we've been doing very much, though, is speaking to some of the residents that we've been speaking to on the hub anyway to understand where their gaps are. And it became quite apparent to us quite early on that if you're not going to be, if you're not going to get your leotard, in, leotard on and, and, and work with Joe Wicks, then perhaps one of the great assets that people had if they couldn't go out, especially those that were clinically shielding, was the garden. So we've been working with uh, the charity Trust Links about how we can get some gardening packs and support into some of our most vulnerable people that are shielding so as they can be physically active um, through horticulture and gardening so simple things like that that perhaps were not on our radar before but that was that that, that was really really important to us um, we've also seen as i mentioned in my my um my presentation one of the things we didn't foresee is we've spent an awful lot of time talking about how we create activity by stealth because people get in there they, they leave their house to go to work and they get in their car and they drive there and then they sit there sedentary all day and then they drive home well um so we, we talked a lot about active travel how do we get people walking cycling running to work well of course that's kind of gone out the window a little bit now because now people just roll down you know to their laptop so as i mentioned with street say that's what that was perhaps one of the bigger examples was that's been turned on its head now we now need to work out how somehow we get people active when they're working from home because the opportunity to turn their their, their journey into into activity has has gone and that was not something we were prepared for so that's perhaps another example um, um, and I think we we need to just keep our eyes and our ears open very much to um, how we are going to continue to do that I think we've got workplace health as one of the commissioners as I mentioned and I think we do need to work with employers so as they are noticing this stuff as well because otherwise it will result if, if they are if their employees are not active their their physical health and their mental health will struggle and we will see greater sickness we will see um, greater mental health issues we will see greater presenteeism where people are are at work but perhaps are not functioning as they should be um, so I think there's lots of work we need to do still um, and we've had, I think our first implementation group back will be what is it we've learned and how do we do things differently and I'll, I'll, that will be one of the things I think I'll report back on next time to this committee thank you Grant thank you chair Thank you very much. I think Councillor Fellows wants to come in, but just before you do, Councillor Fellows, um, I think we're missing one councillor in terms of the video th uh, screen. And I know people perhaps went off camera because they're trying to uh, stop things freezing, etc. from a technological point of view. But I'm being told apparently it's quite important that the councillors are visible, uh, but not so much the officers. Um, so even if we have technological problems, we do need to be visible. Otherwise, if any public who are watching this or subsequently watch this may think, you know, we're, we're not actually here or we've got off to do something else like watch the football, if only. Um, yeah. So, C Councillor Fellows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Grant, for that uh, presentation. Um, I'm somewhat a bit anal about statistics. So, could you tell me how many people have actually um, benefited or taken part in any of the particular programs, please? 
And the second question is, you say we're funded. Um, how long is this program uh, expected to, to, to run, please? Yep. So direct numbers and figures, um, I haven't got that. But what I can tell you that I probably should have told you um, uh, during the presentation is some good news. In what happens is um, Sport England um, run a national uh, run a national survey that's, that's broken down at a borough level every year called Active Lives. Um, which sets out how many people are active, which is which is the percentage of those people that are doing over um, doing five times thirty over a week, or or or, or perhaps perhaps in, in one go even, um, uh, and those that are classified by the chief medical officer, who we see on our TV so often these days, um, as um, as doing as inactive, which is doing under thirty minutes activity a week. Um, I'm pleased to be able to tell you that we have in the last year seen an upsurge of 12.1%, um, 12.1% decrease in the number of inactive residents in our borough. So that's a real positive. Um, so I haven't got the, the, um, the, the, actual, the actual metrics, but I can give you a percentage of the change that we've seen over the last year. So a 12.1% um, decrease in the number that would be termed by the chief medical officer as inactive residents. I am scared of what next year might look like because it would include um, it would include floods and lockdown and, um, and all sorts of things. But yes, there's that. Um, with regards to when we're funded for, so there's, there's, we are we are funded for um, up um, up until um, technically 2021, but. Um, Sport England recognise that this is a long-term approach. So we are in the process of, of we've been invited, I should say, um, that this programme is looking to run until 2025, but we're just in the process now of realigning what that budget looks like so we can submit that to Sport England for confirmation. So although it would never be right of me to say so, but I think the, I think the, the clear expectation um, is that this will be running to 2025, but that the impact that's been made out of that will will live long after that if we do it right. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Uh, sorry, I obviously couldn't see everyone for the whole time, but anyone else want to come in? Not seeing anyone. Uh, okay, Th thanks ever so much, Grant. Appreciate that. Uh, and again, thanks for all your efforts recently. Uh, so we will move on to the community governance review update. Um, over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, the attached to the agenda is the report that I took to Policy and Resources Committee a number of months ago. So I think background reading and sets the context. The um, community governance reviews and the functions associated are, are matters for the Policy and Resources Committee and, and ultimately full council in terms of if any orders are to be made but recognizing the the links with this committee particularly as external bodies and partnerships within within the borough so happy to also provide an update to this committee and, and answer any questions around the review and and the direction of travel that that is being taken as is um so in the report and there's two elements to, to the work that's happening as, as i kind of term it really there is the community governance review and that's really about new parishes, new councils, uh, borders of them, areas covered, electoral arrangements, such as you know, when elections, number of councillors. So really getting any new local councils, town, parish, village into place. Um, and and that's, that the review that's been undertaken, um, the review that was commenced was in response to a petition around the creation of a, a town council in Wickford, and that was, was undertaken. Um, but that led into a, a wider policy proposal, really, that's resulted in a community governance review across the whole borough. And that takes in the, the petition around Wickford. So one review that's that's covering those issues. Um, the interest, I mean, the issue on, on Wickford, if, if that's established, you then see the majority, well, from the majority north of the A127, then the north of the borough would be pretty much fully parished. Uh, we then look south of the A127 and you've just got Bowers, Gifford and North Benfleet that's parished and it was uh, parished back in I think it was 2012. 
uh, that the council established that that parish council and i think that just um that change in the geography of coverage with the establishment of a wickford town council prompted a desire to look across the whole borough and see whether community governance was fit for purpose and in community governance a number of elements but primarily that is about local councils i think it was also recognized that the responsibility for councils was introduced in the uh, Local Government and Public Involvement in Health Act 2007 and the accompanying guidance um, around community governance reviews recommended that a, a full review should be undertaken around every 10 years and, and we've not done one since 2007 and therefore one was about due now. Um, so the review that's been undertaken is across the whole of the borough. Um, it, it encompasses all issues. The, the main issue that, that is being considered is the unparished areas in the borough and whether there's a, a, a desire amongst residents and a benefit in unparished areas being parished and that's the uh, main focus and the council has been very clear and explicit around that however in undertaking a full review it does give opportunity for primarily i think for existing local councils to contribute and for us to deal with any issues that may arise and there's a uh, a small one if Wickford Town Council is established on the um, boundaries that were proposed you end up with a couple of very small polling districts between Ramsden Bell House, Ramsden Craze and the new Wickford Town Council that wouldn't be parished um, and so there'd be a small parcel of land in between and, and working with Ramsden Craze and Ramsden Bell House and kind of looking for, for their guidance and thoughts on how their boundaries may be extended to encompass that area if Wickford was established. So there's some areas that it just allows us to make sure we take a full view rather than limiting the scope of that review. The uh, review uh, has commenced and in a community governance review there's two periods of consultation. The first one is simply inviting representations with regards to the review there are, there are no proposals on the table the council just says we're doing a community governance review we're going to look at everything let us know if you've got any views um, the the next phase is for the council to prepare and publish any proposals and then proposals are much more specific and they may say for example that the council proposes to establish a new parish and town council in wickford these are the area it will cover. This is the number of councillors. This is the name which we intend to give it, uh, etc. And, and we would then consult on them specific proposals. Um, and clearly engagement would be much greater when, when engaging on specific proposals in areas. Uh, that report on, on any proposals is due to be submitted to the Policy and Resources Committee at the end of July just to uh, recognise, you know, in terms of undertaking consultation, there's an impact of the current uh, position on, on COVID. Uh, that was raised by members of the Policy and Resources Committee when looking at their future work programme, and, and we acknowledge that. Um, and the options for Policy and Resources will be to continue with the review and, and go out for consultation on any, any proposals, or wait for a, when, when a better time might be, whenever that will be. But, the issue associated with that is that if we're working toward elections in 2021 for any new parishes, particularly around Wickford, who uh, have been uh, waiting for a little while, then we would want to pursue that. So, But that's an option and, and an option that the Policy and Resources Committee will be asked to consider. So that's kind of around community governance review. And I think the other issue which the report deals with in the secondary piece of work is what we term in the report before you that went to Policy and Resources around a parish strategy and that's about saying and, and articulating I think a bit more clearer um, what is the role or what might be the role of, of local councils you know recognition that they do play a valuable role in the borough um, similar to you know the voluntary sector that you heard about earlier all these all these organizations and, and governance elements uh, provide benefit to the borough um, but when we're looking at um, looking at larger parishes and larger town councils there's kind of a question i think arises around how can they are they're in position to more significantly i would argue benefit the area because the, the larger and got capacity and that's not um 
diminishing the role of smaller parishes who, who play a big role. But it's prompted us to think and, and consider about what might the role be, um, and then that role considering around is the scope for them to perhaps take on some services that the Borough Council may provide at the moment. So uh, want to use the term devolution of some of those. And that's been seen increasingly across the country. Uh, the devolution of services and decisions to parishes, um, having them things primarily around the local environment, the local public realm and street scene at a more local level. And that's something therefore we are considering. Some of that is done through a charter. And we do have a charter with local councils. Uh, it really sits on a shelf and, and has been uh, gathering dust. And, and primarily, I think that's due to the that the, par the borough is only partially parished and it makes it very difficult, I think, to progress down these fairly complicated matters when there's a very, only a, a, a small area parished. If you then start to bring in, in Wickford Town Council and the, the whole of the north of the A127 parished and there's benefits or, or appetite for parishes in the south of the A127, then that becomes a more uh, viable proposition and, and something that is worth exploring further. So we're keen to uh, progress and, and learning and looking at what others have done elsewhere. Um, had discussions with with um, representative of Billericay Town Council and the Association of, of Local Councils. And there's a, a desire to look at this and, and identify how it might work. And I think it's about the borough and local councils working together in the future. We were both there as, as tiers of governance to serve residents and uh, in the area and how can we work together to effectively do that. So there's the two, two pieces of work and I think what we're saying as well is if we're establishing new any new town councils particularly we need to be clear and be able to advise residents you know that's the question well what do they do and uh, that's a, a question which we can articulate I think better through a parish strategy. So there's two elements and that's the second again intent to report to the parish strategy oh sorry to PNR on the parish strategy at the end of July you reference, you'll see in the report around a parish forum that is still intended. So, as I say, following on from discussions with some local council representatives, we were, um, like many things, it appears due to kick off that piece of work uh, in March and, and certainly consulted some members around the membership of that. But I think the intention would be um, post the end of July alongside the second phase of the community governance review for that parish forum, which would be a couple of borough councillors, some local council reps, some community reps, an informal body really, to perhaps learn from other areas that have done this and bring forward proposals around a parish strategy. The two go hand in hand. The two may lead to significant changes um, and opportunities in the borough. The two may lead to no change on the existing uh, whatsoever, except I think the, um, the, the, there is a stated commitment, I think, of the Policy and Resources Committee and all members uh, of that committee to, to see the establishment of a town council in Wickford, where there appears to be a certainly a public appetite that's led to a, a significant petition coming forward that's prompted us to do that review. So whilst I say there may be no change, there, are, um, there is a specific proposal on the table. So a brief update that follows on from the report, that is uh, an overview of where we are. The next steps is the report to PNR on the 23rd of July. We're happy to take any questions, Chairman, and clarify any issues. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate that. Um, as I think I mentioned, uh, the report is just for noting, but if anyone does have any questions, I'm happy to take them and put them to Paul or whatever. So if any anyone wants to indicate, Not oh sorry, Councillor Fellows. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Thanks for the presentation, Paul. I've I've got a couple of questions um, for education. Um, you mentioned uh, that there's a number of parish councils in our borough. One, have we ever surveyed any of those parish councils to see? Um, you you made the decision to go parish. You know, X years later, do you still think it was a good move? Should I put all, all four questions or should I go one at a time and let Paul answer? I think, I think, go, yeah, certainly do two and then maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, right. So that was the first one. Um, if a particular area they decide to go parish, 
and two years down the line, could they say, oh, well, okay, that wasn't good for our community. We, we want out. Is there a mechanism to go back to being non-parish, please? On, uh, yeah, in response to those two issues, Chairman, I think the we've not really surveyed. I mean, we did do a review. Uh, we started a community governance review to look at the electoral arrangements of existing parishes. That was a, a couple of years ago, and I think ended up in policy and resources or what, the akin committee last year. And that was around their electoral arrangements, and primarily that was about um, seeking to align electoral years so we have mm. six councils that have elections in in one year and then we have another that has an election in another year and another that has an election in another year mm. so we sought to do that um and, and that was a review that looked at that we've not surveyed but the strong uh, very clear strong sense is that the, the parishes um you know feel that they're um do a good job and i you know would agree with that as, a, as an advocate i think around those um, I've not surveyed, but I think I would know the response would be um, the continue the would continue to serve, mm -hmm. and wouldn't wish to be. I think in the issue then comes around if any said not, or if in a couple of years um, some felt that that's difficult. Really, there is provision for parishes to be abolished. That would need to be, I think, a, a referral to the Secretary of State, and is very much needing to be a, a, a last case um, scenario, really. Um, so whilst there is provision um, that, you know, is not an issue, certainly that we would want to enter into lightly, clearly if a, a parish was established and it, it fell apart and they weren't able to, primarily if they're not able to attract the councillors, they're not quorum, they're not able to function, then that's a different issue. But I mean, we're very clear around, or certainly we need to be very clear that these are democratically elected tiers of governance, the same as ours, they're independent of us. Um, we seek to work together, but they are they are independent themselves. And whilst we do have some of them and functions, it's a, a dangerous area, but a, a problematic area, I think, to get involved in. That's right. Thank you, right. Councillor Fellows, think you had a couple more points. Um, no, I'll, I'll I'll skip them. Thanks, sir, Mr. Chairman. I think we've got Councillor Sargent next, and then Councillor Holliman. Councillor Sargent. Yes, um, thank you. Um, Paul, I'd like to uh, know if um, what the outcome is of the um, first review. Um, you spoke of existing councils in your uh, uh, review there. What effect will this review have on existing councils because you said I was pleased to hear at the end what how you just answered that one that you are entering into dangerous territory because parish councils are um, local authorities in their own right so I wanted to know what if there is you know what effect this review could have on existing um, because obviously there was a review about abolishing, uh, uh, in the review there was something about abolishing those councils. So, um, you know, if, well, if you can answer those two for the moment, thank you. Yeah, Chairman, very happy to, to do so. I mean, I'll take, take the last point if I can first. You know, we, ha we have, an, and I'll continue to be very clear that the aim of the review is to focus on unparished areas. Um, there is no um, certainly intention in the review, there are, as far as I'm aware, there's no policy intention arising from members around impacting on existing councils. As I say, the purpose of um, not limiting the review and in essence doing a full review of the borough to consider all matters was to uh, enable us to look at unparished areas, but also to, to not, if an issue arose, we didn't want to be in a position where we said, well, sorry, that wasn't within the terms of reference and therefore we can't pick it up. And, I think the example around the, the knock on effects for some parishes where they may feel, um, you know, to, to extend their boundaries or to, to make any changes that they feel uh, would be beneficial. It provides that opportunity and I'll, I'll continue and to state the council's position very clearly that it does not 
intend or have any intention to impact on existing local councils through the community governance review unless the uh, unless it responding to requests and suggestions from parishes themselves and and i think just on the the, the parcel of land that sits between what would be the new whitford town council and ramsden craze and ramsden bell house um, i've been in contact with them and i've made the position that the council would i suspect be very gladly guided by those two councils working together about what might be the most appropriate solution and I know that them two councils are working together and, and holding joint meetings to consider and make representations to the council. So the only effect of the review on, of the community governance review will be that the effect of the parish strategy work would be to give parishes, I think, an opportunity uh, when we look at what happens elsewhere the vast majority is around um, the council saying to parishes if you're interested in taking on some of our services and these are the types we think then let us know and we'll work with you and, and if they don't they don't but if they do then then we'll work with them on that but there's further work to be done at the parish forum on that the outcome of uh, the first stage consultation I, I use the term consultation because it's not really I suppose that it's about inviting representations we have had a few, so primarily it was about councillors, MPs, Essex County Council, existing local councils, about some of them more formal bodies, and we have had um, some responses, not, not a huge amount. We've had a number of responses from people um, around the Wickford um, proposal, um, similar to what we'd had before, so we'd take into account those we'd had previously on Wickford. Um, but I think the, the issue around the first stage, particularly in terms of engagement of the public, that I'm not even sure if we asked the question about what they feel around community governance in their area, um, they would kind of know, know a great deal and have any strong views on that at this time, um, and particularly at this time. But I th And that makes it difficult, and I, I think it is a, an issue that um, I need to discuss with members it makes it a slightly difficult position when then putting forward proposals but the council needs to um, either you know put some things forward as the basis for further consultation and the consultation would really um, be much more rigorous uh, much more important and no doubt attract much more interest when we've got any specific proposals on the table and that is the next stage and I think we'd all agree that that when um, when there's something on the table that affects people and is direct, then they'll engage in that. So um, not, uh, not a significant, I think the first stage is about just them representations, just to get views from people around what they feel. Um, generally, they are people, I suppose, from MPs that are, you know would support local councils, um, some of the benefits that they can do. Um, but, but there's nothing, I think, that um, regrettably or, or certainly not to be expected anything of huge significance that would guide us one way or another and therefore i think the options that to be presented to pnr will will prompt an interest in debate and direction for the council in terms of its second stage of, of consultation would you mind if i come back her chairman please of course thank you um i was very pleased to hear paul that you said that there is a a parish or, a, or a, probably a town council that have waited some time um, and I was pleased to hear it sounded like I hope I haven't got it wrong but it did sound like that the council have in mind to consider that for next May and I think that would only be right and proper to do that because um, you know they've 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 petitioned the council they've done what they needed to do I believe you've the PNR made them a, a shadow council and I do hope that as a result of that next May because they'll have wasted another year next May that they will be able to um, become established or the council will establish them so they can get on and do that work and just one last point if I may chairman on uh, the the parish strategy now that is Basildon Council strategy, a parish strategy. So how will that affect um, existing and 
or how will it either affect, benefit or, or whatever? What attention does parish councils have to uh, play within that, you know, within that parish strategy? We just come back, Chairman. I mean, again, um, turning to the, the latter question first, if I, I may, I think the um, it would be it needs to be a joint thing. I mean, I, in speaking to the um, couple of council reps the other day, local council reps, you know, they, they, this has to be on a basis of effective working relationships between the local councils and and the borough council. You know, even if we had the option and you know to uh, foist services upon local councils, it's just not going to work. It's just going to be too problematic. It needs to be a very much a joint. We do have a charter, and I think it's probably a revision, a refinement, uh, a being clearer in that charter. And that charter is, is an agreement between the local councils and the borough council. You know, for us to just go, this is our strategy and this is what we think you're going to do is is naive to think that that would, would work. It's very much a joint effort. I think the parish forum that is intended is about it being a, a joint effort to bring forward something that um, satisfies all parties but i think it is you know looking and we have been looking over the last few weeks particularly around where this you know where this is happening elsewhere it very much is a framework that says you know we're interested as a borough council in working with local councils we think that things some things may benefit from being done at a more local level you know if you agree local council or or interestingly for the smaller parishes where it's more problematic, the ability for parishes to group together, particularly neighboring councils to, to take on services or work around a particular area, it provides a framework for that to happen. So I think in providing a framework and options, it would only benefit local councils. I think a, a framework and a strategy would only be the start of it. And then it's around that um, real engagement and liaison and joint working as we go forward to see where the opportunities to improve things for residents may be by by changing who may deliver certain things. I think on the Wickford, I would just all I can do is clearly it's a, a, a member matter, a political matter, but the it was clearly stated around policy and resources committee, a commitment to or is certainly a strong desire to see the establishment and for that to be in, in 2021. I think you, you're right, they have um, uh, been delayed um, and we were uh, delay was uh, regrettable, I think, as we referenced in the report, but was felt to be for, for the right reasons, I think. In hindsight, and the irony is that the elections wouldn't have taken place this year anyway. So we've we've kind of not lost, but that's not not to diminish. And, and certainly, what I mentioned at the last policy and resources committee, when questioned about the appropriateness of consulting on the second stage, was very much what you you said, if, and and the point that if we don't kick on, then we'll miss twenty twenty one elections, and and the the most the the. The area that would be most significantly detrimented, perhaps, and certainly those that support it, would be in Wickford. So uh, I'll be guided by the Policy and Resources Committee on the 23rd of June, but we'll be in July. But we're we'll making it clear in that report that, you know, we, we members are keen, and the, the residents are keen, and the Shadow Town Council is keen for elections to take place in 2021. And uh, the council would um, be recommending perhaps that we seek to to work towards that, but presenting alternative options if if members feel that that's not not appropriate but um hopefully for those are helpful and set out you know clear in setting out our commitment really i think it's a a positive direction of travel that we're presenting and and a desire to work to do to improve things for residents um and, and make sure that um that the additional layers of governance work effectively together and that we deliver um improvements for residents because additional tiers of governance need to deliver improvements and in delivering them improvements as a role for us and for existing and, and for new local councils. So the commitment is strong and I look forward to the report in July, which hopefully will just take this forward a next step, but certainly um, a fair bit more work to do ahead of any elections in 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, Councillor Holliman indicated he wanted to speak. So Councillor Holliman. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Paul, um, <laughs> I appreciate that this particular topic is not specific to this committee and it's more aimed at the PNR uh, at some other point, but um, it probably hasn't escaped anybody's attention here that there's been one or two 
minor uh, obstacles popping up over this year, which may have changed a few concepts uh, for people throughout, throughout the country. Um, there was uh, a, an idea or a dream, I, I would say, put forward um, probably nearly two years ago now to the people of Wickford um, of forming a town council and one of the things that came up, surprise, surprise, was the financial impact of, of forming a, a town council. Um, and uh, this was sort of diminished slightly by uh, comments coming back from some of the uh, proposed candidates for that uh, council positioning, that the precepts would uh, cover a considerable amount and what is actually needed from residents would be very, very minimal. Um, as I said, one or two things have happened to us over the last few months, which potentially will change the face of the planet, let alone Wickford. Um, and the government has, uh, has quite rightly um, been very, close in, in, in discussing financial impact in the next financial year or from this point on. Um, and I'm just concerned, and, and I don't know where, where this should be placed for maximum effect, but I'm just concerned that the, the concepts that were discussed nearly two years ago for the formation of this particular uh, council um, were, faced, were, were placed uh, on completely redundant policies as of now, because we are heading into uncharted territory in terms of both the outlook and the financial impact, which is gonna hit this country very, very strongly over the next few months. Um, so I, I suppose what I'm asking is a, 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 a really some sort of guidance on the timetable that is going to be put up now, whether that's going to continue or whether there will be an extended timetable, considering that nobody that I can see in this country has got enough information to actually say, yes, we can now form a town council. This will be the financial basis and this is how it will all go ahead. Um, and the last little element to this is that I also, because of the uh, disaster that fell all of us, the feelings from residents, which I'm getting back from people now, is that really this is a little bit too soon to be thinking about town councils because we've got far more bigger fish to fry uh, for everybody within the whole borough for, for some considerable time. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, are, are, we, are we not giving this whole question um, a, a, a wide enough berth to dis for further discussions? Thank you, Chairman. I think, Chairman, just to come back, I mean, if we, if we want to look specifically at the, the Wickford proposal and how people's views on that may have changed since it was first uh, muted, I think in terms of the timetable, if we want to look at that one specifically, if the council was to agree a proposal at the end of July, the proposal being that we will establish a Wickford Town Council and it will have X number of councillors and it will be called this, etc., then that would be subject to consultation with the residents of Wickford and that would take place over the autumn. So I think that's helpful, really, in then letting people consider, you know, in the autumn as, as in, and since that change in the last couple of years, do they... Uh, still or do they do they support a town council or not so there would be that consultation and that is the whatever consultation has been done in the past the consultation on specific proposals is I would argue the key one it's this is what we're proposing either say yeah yeah or no, yeah they're just going to project to move things forward um I, I mean I think you've basically answered this already but you know if you if you want to elaborate a bit more that there will be a consultation and we will make the decision based on that consultation. Mm. So yes, we are in a new world, but in terms of the process, that will that will carry on in the same way. The outcome of that 
will depend on that process and that consultation. Yeah, Is that fair enough? Not really. I wanted to hear Paul's comments because what you've just summed up in about three words was was only about a sixteenth of what I discussed with Paul, and I would just like to hear that further. Well, you rambled on quite a bit, Councillor Holliman, but um, and it was and more no further than anybody else did. It was exactly a, time in that one, and um, it was more than I'm three. Not sure what the idea is of shutting me down all the time, but uh, well, well if it's, it's the first time you spoke tonight, so I've hardly shut you down. Uh, however, I'll go back to Paul, and he can answer it further if you want. But I feel he's answered it. But Paul, over to you. The only thing I, I would add further, I think, is that you know the specifics around that in terms of whether. The issue with parishes is, is always, you know, the, the negative will always generally come from a precept. You know, that's where, and then when we let when we look at the what the Wickford responses were in the initial phase, it was about it was I think slightly fifty six percent for you know, fifty six people for forty odd again. So very slight difference. And it wasn't exactly resounding. Uh, yeah, majority. the majority that were opposed um, was was due to precept, and that's always difficult, and it's always difficult as well because. We won't propose a precept. So what we say, and the precept will be, you know, we can say what the average in the borough is, and that's around 26, 27 pounds per bandy equivalent across the borough on existing local council. We can say that, but I think the issue as well is that, and, and where the parish strategy, you know, has the biggest thing is how the apportionment of precepts changes potentially. Um, it's a very complicated issue, but clearly the precept would be greater if local councils are doing a lot more services because they need to be funded but how might that impact on the boroughs so a complicated position i think the the issue around that um as, as council the chairman says we will consult and, and as i said earlier there's a long way to go on this issue there's a lot to think about a lot more to consider july will help us um, just take stock and consider how we take it forward but i think the comments you make are certainly ones that we're, we're well aware of and are matters that would need to be considered by all members as we go through the next uh, six to nine months on this on this issue um apologies for interrupting but we seem to have lost councillor holliman uh i think he may have left the meeting but i'm not sure is there uh, any way we can get some clarification on that, councillors, please? Well, that's one for Councillor Lawrence and Councillor Sargent, I think. I'm, I'm not prepared to hold up the meeting very long to see if uh, he has or has not left. I'll, I'll, I'm prepared to give it a minute or two, but that's about it. Well, we wouldn't really know, Chairman, because we're all in our we're all in our own homes. But I will say, I think you were slightly unfair to him because he did put something that he felt was pretty significant uh, to the officer, and um, you know that that's that's what it was. And as you said, it's the only time that he'd spoken, and I think that's you know this has been a long meeting, so um, I think it was I think he was within his rights to asked the officer and and paul provided that response it's just I think he did provide that response but I, that councillor sergeant if i might just say i i simply made the point that i felt councillor uh, paul had already made that point um and like i say it's a long meeting so i'm trying to as a chair to move it on i'm not trying to give anyone a hard time or be difficult. I'm just trying to keep the meeting going. Councillor Lawrence, I think you indicated. Yes, Councillor Holliman's confirmed he's left the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, uh, I don't think there's any uh, anyone else wants to speak on this matter. It was only for noting. I thank you, Paul, uh, for your uh, full update on the situation. Uh, obviously, we'll be looking at carefully going forward, but I appreciate. Um, you're taking the time and I'm sorry for bumping you down the order and all I would say is because I don't want to give anything away for people who might be watching highlights later there is some good news in that it doesn't look like Liverpool will be winning the league title at Goodison Park on Sunday and I'm very very happy about that so I'll try to be nice to everyone now um, but if we could, so thanks very much, Paul. You're done. If you want to go watch the football or put your kids to bed or whatever, that that's great. Uh, and now, if we could bring in Joe to do the our place update. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Chair, and hello, everyone. Um, I appreciate that we're getting towards the end of a very busy agenda, so I'm not proposing to spend too much time giving what is a verbal update on the progress of our place. Um, councillors will remember that we came to the committee in January, I believe it was, to talk about the, the next phases of our place and our intention to secure external support to deliver phases uh, two and three of our place. Um, as I think everyone would anticipate and expect, the timeline for this has been altered somewhat by coronavirus. Um, I'll talk through how that's impacted things in a minute. But the important thing to say is that we've now engaged with um, Hemingway Design, who are the company helmed by Wayne Hemingway, the former founder and designer behind the big and successful fashion brand um, Red, Dead, uh, Red or Dead. Um, he's got uh, an international reputation, both as a designer, but also now as a, a place branding specialist. And he's worked with a variety of towns and cities across the UK to look at the development of an authentic brand identity and narrative about those places, which councillors will recall was always the ultimate intention of the Our Place programme. So we've now engaged with them to support us in delivering phase two and phase three of the activity. Um, their role is to really help engage with partners across the borough and to, to encourage ownership of this outside the council. You'll remember that the intention for Our Place is always at the end product becomes more than something that we deliver and ends up stuck on a collective virtual shelf somewhere but is actually much more focused on uh, a brand and identity that everyone buys into. Hemingway Design will also add an independent and specialist view that will challenge our assumptions and the assumptions of our partners and more importantly than anything else they they have a lot of expertise in community engagement and place making in these areas and as I said they've already got a really really strong track record across the country and what's really interesting about them is that the work that they've done has almost exclusively been with places that have got um, reputations that uh, but that perhaps aren't a fair representation of, of the city or the town or perhaps they've worked with some some um, areas that are sort of post-industrial or seaside resorts places like that it's not they have done some work with, with other locations as well but it's not um, a, an organization that's only ever worked with places that have a preconceived glamour about them they're, they're really good at working with authentic places to get underneath the story of the place um, so we're now moving into to phase two of our place we've now moved into phase two of our place and the first thing that we've done is to look back at the data that we already collected for, uh, um, through phase one but in the light of coronavirus so you'll recall that we had a large scale engagement exercise last year. All of the data that we got from that is still very valid, but Hemingway have got their own expertise. So they've looked at that for us to understand where they might do some more targeted work. They will also be looking to do some specific engagement with our, with our residents and other stakeholders to take into account um, what's what's changed or what's new as a result of coronavirus. I mean, we've, we've heard today, uh, this evening, sorry, lots of different stories about how coronavirus has really brought the best out of our communities but also had a significant impact on our communities and it, it just wouldn't make sense to carry on with this work without giving some recognition to the fact that this has been a very very significant event so we need to bear, bear that in mind and ensure that um you know they sure that 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 new viewpoint is incorporated in the work that they do so some of the areas that they'll be looking at is, is working out what, what makes Basildon truly distinctive, um, trying to work out things around the atmosphere and the personality of Basildon and, and how that reflects in the way that the, the, the borough and different locations within the borough feels. And then looking at the shared values and the narratives that will help us build a common understanding of what, of what Basildon is. I mean, we, you remember last time that the feedback that we got from phase one of our place showed a really wide range of views about the borough based obviously on people's individual experiences and that ranged really you know quite widely from areas from people giving feedback of great pride in where they lived and in the borough as a whole and some people as we know at the other end of the scale saying that they felt ashamed to live here so what we're looking for is to try to find something that people can unify around and make sense to as many people as possible across the borough um, so we'll be doing some work um, in the summer. July is the intended date to doing some in-depth stakeholder engagement. So as well as working with the public and also our partners, um, Hemingway Design are also going to be leading um, a piece of work specifically looking at how we can 
bring our creative communities into this space. So obviously we've got a very well established artistic community within Basildon. Um, we've already accessed that and, and started to bring that together through things like the Basildon Consortium. And I'm sure members will also have seen the, the, the really successful music video that we, we created with the able assistance, support, input and performance of local musicians. So we've got this really tangible creative community in Basildon that Hemingway Design C is one of the fundamental sort of access points into a story and a narrative and identity for the borough that makes sense. And obviously people who work in those types of fields are much more used to this kind of creative exercise. So they're going to be one of the key groups that will be involved in phase in phase two. But we will also, as, I, as I've said, looking forward to um, working with our businesses, with our residents. And we know we also need to do some, some work around how we engage with our public sector partners and of course, how we provide opportunities for elected members to be involved in phase two as well. So that, that's an update. The stakeholder, the stakeholder engagement sessions that are happening in July, they were originally scheduled to happen in March, April. And that just hasn't proved feasible given everything that's been going on with coronavirus. Hemingway Design have got the responsibility for working out how we can do this virtually. I think it's going to be a really interesting challenge because to do this successfully, we do need to involve hundreds of people from across the borough. And uh, you know, how that works in a virtual environment like this, I think that could that has the potential to be incredibly challenging, but that's obviously one of the advantages of having this kind of external support because it gives them um, an opportunity to do something interesting, exciting and experimenting, but also means that we can trust in their expertise to deliver something which we would probably struggle to deliver ourselves. So the timeline has been altered, but not so significantly. And I think it's the best that we could possibly have hoped to achieve, given that we've had this pandemic in the middle of all of this. And we're still very much on track to deliver the original objectives of our place. And it should hopefully be a really exciting piece of work. And I'll leave that there, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I can see Councillor Fellows indicating. Councillor Fellows. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thanks for that uh, presentation, uh, Joe. I've, I've got a, a quick question. Um, Hemingway did design, you say they're engaging with various partners. As Basel and Town Centre is out for the regeneration, is uh, out for consultation, and there's some very big players uh, uh, chomping at, at the bit to get involved. And going back to the forerunner of this particular uh, programme that you're, uh, you're talking about, um, there was a lot of discussion back in those days, two, three years ago, about you know reimagining um, Basel and Town Centre. Um, how are Hemingway Designs in, engaged in in the kind of uh, the, the reimagining of, of Basel and Town Centre? It's a, it's a really good question because there are several things happening at the moment which at the very least have some very strong interdependencies. So the, the master planning exercise that's currently being undertaken for the town centre and the wider regeneration of the town centre obviously has a very um, pronounced impact on, on the look and the feel and the identity of the borough as a whole. Similarly, members may be aware of the inclusive Basildon Town Centre project as well, which is being driven through the Housing and Communities Committee, which is looking at how we can make sure that the Basildon Town Centre of now and the future is, is as inclusive and as accessible as possible. And that lends itself to sort of thinking about the identity of the borough. And there are a couple of other uh, of the town centre and, and therefore um, wider ramifications for the borough. Uh, and there are a couple of, of examples of other areas of work which we have to ensure are properly incorporated within the overall product of our place. So they're not they're not mutually exclusive and, and they won't be contradictory, but we do need to ensure that the, the, the work that's being taken forward through the master planning exercise and the wider growth agenda, that can happen and, and, and that's valid intrinsically and doesn't, it doesn't need to become part of our place. But what, what comes out of that, the findings from that process need to feed into that end product. So essentially, the way I would look at it is that we're lucky to have quite a few different stakeholder events all happening at once that are covering slightly different ground that give us a very rounded perspective of, um, of, of, of what, what the identity and the look and the feel of the borough is. Um, that, so I think, like, it's a really good question. But Councillor Fellows, do you want to come back on that or is that okay? Thank you. 
Sorry, I think Councillor Sargent's indicated. Is that right? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, there's two at the moment. There are two current quotations through on the model plan, and it's all during COVID. They're obviously costing a heck of a lot of money. And we learned, I think, today that the response from one of them is very, very low. You are proposing that we do another one again during COVID, which I don't think is a very good idea at all because the previous phase one consultation did not bring um, a lot of responses either. Regardless of what's been said, you know, that is, that is the fact. And what I don't understand is why are we carrying out all of these um, consultations during COVID? What is the rush? Surely, if you want to gain as much opinion and get some real good meaty information coming forward, and you've said yourself in the report, Joe, that this Hemingway are very good at getting opinions of hard to reach groups. How, yes, it is a challenge doing it through COVID and doing it virtually. So how on earth how are they going to do that virtually when under normal circumstances, the very people that you need to get input from are hard to reach? So, I mean, that in itself is a challenge that I don't think we should be, you know, we should be undertaking. So what I'm going to suggest, Chairman, is that this whole um, exercise is put on hold because A, it's during a time of very, very difficult um, virtual consultations because from the master plan, it's all online. Not, there is no other way a resident can respond unless they write into the council, but goodness knows how that will happen. And also the costs. We've already spent 50,000. Council, I read, put 60,000 in. Is that for phase two or is it phase two and three? Because otherwise, where is it going to end and for what outcome? Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Council Sergeant. I'll bring I'll bring Joe in in a second. But uh, if I could just say one thing in terms of response to uh, stage one, you stated as fact it was a very a very low response. That is not fact. That is not true. And I'm sure Joe will enlighten you more on that. But we've been through this ground before. Again, we had a very very high response rate. Uh, one of the biggest consultations we've ever embarked on uh, so to say that there was no you know it was a low response rate i'm sorry you can, it's just not true it just isn't true um in terms of the, however your second point about doing this during covid is an absolutely valid one and i accept that and what i would hope you would accept is we've had you uh, you know very detailed conversations with Hemingway design about how we go forward and if this is possible and whether we should postpone it and given their experience and what they've done and what the, they put a lot of work in to analyzing what can and can't be done their view is yes we can do it now if the answer is yes we can do it then yes we should do it and in terms of the outcome the outcome is simple, and I, I, we have explained this before, so I'm sorry if I seem a little impatient, but there's two massive outcomes. One is we get a response from the public of Basildon telling us what matters to them that we've never had before. That guides our decision-making going forward. That's hugely important. Secondly, which is just as important, we develop a genuine, and I don't like the term particularly, but a genuine Basildon brand. So we've got an offer to, to uh, businesses and other potential partners going forward. Now, we needed that before, Councillor Sergeant, but we really, really 
need it now because everyone is going to be scrambling for every bit of investment pounds there are out there. Now, I, I'm sure you want the same outcome as me. We want to grab as many of those investment opportunities as possible to put Basildon in as good a place as possible because we know we've got a tough time coming. So that is where the outcomes are. And I'm, I'm sorry if I seem impatient, but I thought I'd explain them before. But in, in, in the changed world, they're actually even more important. Joe, do you want to add anything? I mean, all I would say is it, it is a very fair challenge. Um, I think there's a, there's a need to differentiate between this activity and the, the master plan consultation. I definitely understand the points that you're making in that regard, but obviously that's uh, the remit of a separate committee and, and we, we should be really clear about phase two and phase three is not a consultation in the same way that phase one was. was where we were trying to garner as many around ensure hear from a, a representative sample of, of, of the borough's residents and, and you're absolutely right about the difficulties of reaching the people that we will need to reach but I would argue that is the the significant advantage of having external support to deliver this because we can place the burden of responsibility for ensuring that happens on them and they've, they've got confidence that they can achieve that for us. The other thing I would say about the timing and like I say it is a fair challenge about doing this during a, uh, the moment of, um, of you know the, as things currently are but the other thing I'd say about the timing is that there are there are two sort of distinct advantages to it, one of which the chair's just alluded to. But the first one is actually, you know, we've heard today about the level of increased activism and um, um, activity and engagement from our communities through their own ad hoc and impromptu responses to the coronavirus pandemic. And I think what a time to try to harness that energy and enthusiasm in terms of engaging with this really broad topic that's got the potential to shape and reflect everyone's in everyone's future in the borough. But the other thing is, you know, we, we hope that at some point soon we'll be able to formally talk about moving into a phase of recovery. I mean, we're already in recovery mode in many respects, but I think the whole country's on tenterhooks about whether or not at some point we'll get a second wave, but we hope that we'll be able to move into recovery fairly soon. And as we do that, we will be transitioning, as the chairs alluded to, into very difficult territory economically, the way that that's going to affect and challenge and impact our communities. And we will need a strong story about who Basildon is and why Basildon is important. And some of that is definitely about investment. Some of that's about pride and that community spirit and that cohesion among communities to ensure that they can maintain this momentum that they've built up and, and work together as they move into what could potentially be some really, really difficult times because of, of, of the expected financial impact. So I, I definitely recognise the challenge. I think it's really a really fair one, but I think there are also some significant benefits that we can achieve by doing this now rather than waiting. And then I suppose the other thing to say is we, we also don't know how long we'd have to wait. It, it could be an indefinite period of time. So I think if we can do this now and harness that, that sort of energy and activism that we found out in the communities, it, it serves the benefit as well. Chairman, can I come back with just one more question, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sergeant, you're on mute at the moment, I think. Sorry, I thought I took it off. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Joe, you spoke of um, involving elected members. I wish you would involve the elected members of this committee because we come here with no knowledge whatsoever. I mean, the the uh, report that you gave us last last meeting um, was quite complicated, um, uh, it, and and we I don't think we saw it beforehand. But I mean, it would be nice because the chairman's alluded to the work that Hemingway do, it would have been nice had, you know, maybe they'd been invited and the committee could have asked them some questions because, you, you know, this is this is the problem. You are not involved in this committee. All we get is we sit here and when we give our view, you don't like it, but I'm entitled to ask. But if you could answer that, Joe, I'd be very pleased how you intend to involve us. Many thanks. Hmm. I mean, I, I think um, the 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 the, um, the idea of having Hemingway either along to this um, committee formally or to perhaps even better, like an informal meeting of the committee, is a really good idea. We're we're not at that stage at the moment. I don't think, um, to be fair to them, I don't think they would have 
a, enough of the conclusions they need to draw from the data analysis and they don't have enough um they know they know how they want to approach this task but it's not formally laid out in a project plan yet which they would then be able to talk through with you but i i'm sure wayne would be really happy to come and, and spend some time with you and i think that would be a really positive contribution to the overall exercise so i i'd i happily take that feedback on board sorry thanks for that joe um yeah no th and thank you councillor sergeant uh we'll we'll see what we can do with that uh, but I think to go back to your other point, um, I think it was a bit unfair, actually, because this committee operates the same way as every other committee does. You, you, you get the report sent to you in the same timescale that other committees do. When I, at the outset of this committee being formed and regularly since, I've said, look, I want this to be a cross-party uh, engagement process. I want input. I haven't had any. We haven't had any. So for you to say you're not being involved, I, I'm sorry, I'm staggered. But anyway, uh, unless there's any more comments on that, it's to be noted. Can we move forward to the COVID-19? Well, I did make a suggestion, Chairman, that we put this on hold. Maybe you'd like to consider that. Uh, do you want to put that to the vote? Are you absolutely sure you want to waste the time putting it to the vote? Yeah, oh, I've got it. I've got no, no time to waste. Yeah. No, I'm sure you haven't. I'd like to make the suggestion that it's put on hold until we are further along with the COVID uh, pandemic. Thank you. And would there be a seconder? I'll second it for it. uh okay to the vote councillor sergeant i assume you're voting in favor of your motion yes i'm voting in favor yeah councillor lawrence i assume you're voting in favor yeah of the motion what such as it is councillor fellows how are you voting i vote against the motion chair thank you councillor fellows councillor gordon how are you voting i'll vote against the motion chair and just to make it clear, Councillor McGurran is voting against as well. That was a couple of minutes of our time, really well spent, wasn't it? And typical of the negative approach of the Conservative group on this committee. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but I think it has to be said. Can we now move on to the COVID-19 impact assessment, please, Joe? Um, I was going to uh, talk about two things during this um, this update because obviously it's uh, um, the service committee um, doesn't have many direct services underneath it. Most of those will have been covered at the other committees. I was going to talk about the community hub, but I think we've had um, better updates about that than I could do. Um, I was fortunate enough to be privileged enough to be one of the SLT members that has led this the establishment of the hub, and I've been involved ever since its inception, but you've already heard from Grant and our voluntary sector partners who've played a much more direct role in it than me. So I don't think there's any need to recover that, but other than to say, in terms of this committee's remit, it has been an exceptional example of partnership working at its best. And, and I think we've all acknowledged that already. The The other thing that I really wanted to touch on was our, um, our work around communications. So um, obviously, communications team falls underneath me but also it is it is well within the remit of this committee and I think it's worth just spending a bit of time to think about the the impact that this has had on our communications as a council. Um, we have seen a, a massive increase in demand on our need to communicate as you would expect and it's a role that we've willingly played and the team have done a great job of adapting to that environment. It's been incredibly demanding at times but a really fulfilling period of time as well, because as is quite often the case with this pandemic experience, and obviously, as we've said already today, no one is in any way negating the, you know, the dreadful impact that this has had on those people who've been personally affected by the tra by tragedies involved with, with, pan uh, with coronavirus. But there are also a range of opportunities that have sort of presented itself as well. And we found that um, this has enabled us to, to communicate directly to literally hundreds of thousands of people in a way that perhaps wouldn't have been previously possible and we've had some incredibly good um, 
uh, sort of accomplishments in terms of our ability to reach as many people in the borough as possible with with a whole range of different communications techniques so including our emails our website visits and our social media activity we've achieved a reach that wouldn't previously have been possible and it's been really well received by residents as well and i think that's been what's you know obviously most important within this especially at first it was an incredibly uncertain time um, central government messaging, you know, has been has been clear. It's been concise in lots of different ways, but it does apply to the whole country. And there is always going to be room and for for confusion and for further clarification to be required. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the communication team and, of course, the whole council for whom they communicate um, have done a great job of making sure that people understand the the, the sort of the way in which national guidance impacts us here at a local level in Basildon. So, I mean, we've had some, like I say, some really, really tremendous figures in, ter you know, in terms of our email system. We've delivered emails to over 600,000 recipients. Now, obviously, there aren't 600,000 people in the borough, but we've reached that many people with each of our individual emails. We've had hundreds of thousands of those emails being open and read. Um, we've had a massive increase in the subscribers to our standard emails so that people are understanding what's going on across a range of different services and a range of different topics that are relevant to them. We've had seriously impressive reach on social media with things, you know, stories such as the balloon display on the Basildon and sign and the, and the testing unit at the Sporting Village, uh, Don Shepherd's 100th birthday, which is obviously a proud moment for everyone associated with the borough and things like the NHS Local Musicians Tribute, they've all had thousands and thousands of views, follows, likes, retweets, Facebook, Facebook shares. I mean, it's been an incredible sort of movement around the social media and traditional media avenues that the, the comms team deploy on behalf of the council. Obviously, it's had its consequences in terms of um, trying not to lose sight of the other stuff that's still equally important but has been classed more as business as usual. I think it's fair to say there were at least two, probably four weeks where the entire output of our comms team was focused on the pandemic experience, which is kind of what you'd expect, but it does mean that we have to think really clear, um, clearly and cleverly about how we continue to communicate the other stuff that's going on, the other great work that the council's doing. But it has been um, a really sort of rewarding time for the for the team. And, and like I say, it's not it's not just them. It's, it's working on behalf of the entire council to ensure that people understand the role that Basildon Council is, are playing in supporting them in their everyday lives through what has been anything but an everyday experience. So I'll leave that there. That's the only thing I was going to raise at this point, Chair. Thanks for that, Joe. Uh, appreciate it. Um, yeah, and echo your thoughts about the comms team. It's been challenging for uh, all, all people, all, all members of staff, but I think the comms team have really, you know, ris risen to the occasion. And also, I should say, uh, the, the senior leadership team, and I'm sure everyone would echo this, have been working really, really hard from, from you know, uh, the, from before the lockdown, uh, when it became apparent where, where we were headed, all the way through. Um, and, you know, they've done a really good job. And I, I also think that the council has come out of this very well thus far obviously we need to be careful that that continues to be the case uh but i think there's a lot more uh of you know we don't get that much appreciation normally as councillors or as council staff but i think there's been a bit more recognition of that which is which is which is nice and uh hopefully we can build on that because that that's a, a positive uh is anyone indicating at the moment no Oh, Councillor Fellows. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just a very quick uh, 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 thank you to Joe and his team. Um, been on the receiving end of all of those communications, I have been mightily, I really mean mightily in, impressed of the information sharing, and it gives you a feeling in these terrible times, it gives you a feeling of some comfort um, to see exactly how our officers um, from the bottom all the way through to the top, have, have they've responded and supported all of our uh, residents? So, so thank you. Thanks, Councillor Fellows. A anyone else on this point? No, it doesn't look like it. Uh, I'll just finish by saying, and um, not everyone may agree, but hopefully, hopefully they will. That I also think that 
uh, our leader has has led from the front. I think his clear messaging in terms of Facebook, et cetera, but particularly the Facebook, the, the willingness to engage directly with residents and give a clear message has, has well, it's been well appreciated and I think rightfully so, but I won't say any more than that, but uh, thank you. Uh, right, so I think, unless anyone else wants to uh, say anything and I don't think they do, that just leaves the work programme. Now there is one, item here that I, I do need to mention and I think you've been notified but if you haven't uh, I'll just explain very briefly so going forward economic development will be added to this committee's uh, workload uh, so basically it's been transferred from the infrastructure and inclusive growth committee um, and going forward it'll be, we will be the external affairs and economic development committee now as a result of that and actually i was going to suggest it anyway because things are moving fast there's a lot going on i'm hoping with the help of annie and karina we can arrange a july meeting because i already thought the gap between now and october was too long uh, particularly given our remit has been expanded i think that makes sense i hope that, that makes sense to everyone else um so the main function of, of a July meeting, hopefully we can get one, uh, is to restructure the work programme given the new remit of the uh, committee. A anyone like to say anything about that? Not seeing anyone? Uh, Councillor Sergeant, I'll hand up. Oh, sorry, I, beg, I do beg your pardon. Councillor Sergeant. Are we on the work programme? Or we are. I can't hear you. Sorry, I beg your pardon. I did what you did earlier. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, we are on the work programme. Um, I'd like an item added to the work programme, if I may. Yeah, OK. What is it? Um, a cellar. OK. Um, it, in what, you know, not being difficult, in what respect do you want that added? It's a, to part, the it's a partnership. Yeah, it is, and it's an important one. I personally have no problem with that. So if, if if anyone else has an issue with it, please speak now or forever hold your peace. Can I just ask what what about a seller though? Like what like you know, in terms of they have quite a wide remit and they, they serve a lot of functions across South Essex. So is it just a briefing in terms of to bring us up to speed on what they are, or is it a specific area of a seller that we're looking to scrutinize look at contribute towards i'm assuming it's a briefing from a seller on what they do and how we feed into that uh, i've been quite involved in a seller myself but uh, obviously it was councillor sergeant who suggested it so councillor sergeant would you like to just clear that you know clear it up a little bit? yes i mean a seller uh, affects basildon enormously so, uh, so, I mean, why would we not want to? And, I mean, Councillor Gordon spoke of scrutiny. I don't know where scrutiny comes in. I don't think we've scrutinised anything on the whole council, let alone this. But I just like to see what a seller does and be able to question and to know what the work is and how, how it affects Basildon. Thank you. I th thank you. I think from what you're saying then, um... It, it is to invite a seller along uh, to give us a briefing and an update of where they're at. Um, that generally goes to p &R, I think, but I have no issues if other councillors want a, an update and a briefing from a seller as trying to facilitate that. Joe, over to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely fine. And I, th I think it would, we could ease, you know, we could definitely have an item here because of, that external facing um, and partnership aspect of a seller, invite relevant officers and, and perhaps partners along to give us the the status of where the partnership is and what its current activity focuses are, because it, you know, it is doing a lot of work and I think it's right that this committee is cited. Yeah, it's fine. Actually, just if, if I may, going back to Councillor Sargent's point, I think actually, if we're gonna do that, we might try and get a couple of other organizations like Opportunity South Essex in as well, because there's kind of one of my issues with a seller is there's 
OSC and there's another one I can't remember at the moment, but it'll come to me and I'll let you know uh, that all are doing similar but different things. And one of my frustrations is how that all works together and where Basildon fits into it. So I think actually what we're probably looking at is, is a seller, OSC and whoever else fits into that, if we can get them together. But I'm mindful we're going to have quite a busy work program, which is fine. Uh, so we might want to think about timings, etc. But I do think even, you know, we definitely need a July meeting just to sort out the work program and the timetable going forward, because it has got a little confused. But obviously, given the background circumstances, that's not entirely surprising. So if everyone is is content with that, that's what I've yeah, uh, thanks, Councillor Sergeant. But that's what I suggest going forward. Uh, Councillor Sergeant has raised her hand again, Chair. Sorry. Councillor Sergeant. Councillor Sergeant. Chairman, this evening we've had three presentations from the voluntary sector. Yeah. And you're exactly the same with the seller. A seller is an organisation of its own. I don't know about the other organisations that you're talking about, but what I have personally asked to have on the agenda this evening is, uh, or, or, sorry, to put onto the work programme this evening, is a seller. Joe said it would be a good idea. I think that if we get other organisations in, we're going to have a bit of them, a bit of that, and a bit of the other. And so I would much prefer, I mean, you are the chairman, yes, but I am a member of this committee. I've asked if a seller can come along on their own. There's nothing to say that you can't invite the others at another time. Otherwise, we'll have another meeting like tonight where more people want to say things, but because of the time restrictions, they, they pack it all in too tightly. Thank you. Uh, you'll be surprised to hear, Councillor Sergeant, I disagree, because Opportunity South Essex and a seller occupy similar spaces. So I think it's important to have them in the same room. Now, we can put it to the vote if you want, but I fail to see what the problem is with having the two organisations. I've got no issue with having an update from a seller. Like I say, there is an element of replication, which at times previously you've been very quick to point out yourself. But I think given the external uh, partnerships element of, of, of the committee, there is room for a briefing from a seller and the OSE. Uh, so I, I suggest we have an update from a seller and the OSE, and I'm prepared to put that to the vote. So, Councillor... Fellows. I accept that, that we have them at the same time. Councillor Gordon. I mean, yeah, it's fine. I vote for. Uh, and just to be clear, Councillor McGurran's voted in favour of what I've just nominated. I should have asked for a seconder, but I think we'll probably live with that. Councillor Sergeant. I'll second it if you need. Ah, thank you. Sorry. Councillor Sergeant. Obviously, I'm voting against, but this is the first ever item I've put on the agenda, and still you as the chairman, you override everything, so I'm totally, I'm quite unhappy with that. I accept the vote, um, I accept the vote, but I asked you, the well, chairman. I think, I think we need Councillor Lawrence to vote as well. I think, I think we need Councillor Lawrence. Not inclusive. Sorry, I think we need Councillor Lawrence to vote. I'll vote against tobacco. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay. Therefore, the the, the, the motion to ha have a seller and uh, opp opportunity South Essex at one meeting has been carried. I, I'm really mystified, Councillor Sergeant, why you are so agitated. Basically, your suggestion has been embraced by the committee. We've just added another element to it. So why you, you are so angry, I really don't know. But anyway, we've taken, on, we've, taken, we've taken on board your suggestion. Councillor Gordon. So on the work programme, we have a transport update that's coming in August. Um, one of the things I'd be really keen that we focus on, and we might need to invite a few more people along to do it, is how pu public transport in 
South Essex is going to recover post COVID. So um, I'd be really keen to see what the comms plan is around that, um, how our bus and rail networks are sort of uh, going to encourage people back to rail and using buses again. Um, because one of my concerns is obviously, as quite rightly at the moment, people are uh, limiting their use of public transport um, and perhaps using their personal motor vehicles as the impact of COVID-19 lessens and we go into recovery phase, um, we need to be encouraging people to use our, uh, our buses and trains again. Um, and I think we need, a, um, you know, all agencies in, in, in South Essex need to join together to do that because I think that's gonna be absolutely essential um, going forward. Um, so I really think thinking in that transport update, thinking about how they are working or how they were going to be working to recover post COVID is is essential for me. Thanks, Councillor Gordon. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Obviously, that update should have taken place in March for obvious reasons. We didn't have the meeting in March. So the the briefing, the update we'll be getting when that they comes to that meeting will be will be very different. Joe, do you want to add anything there? Joe? Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. No, I mean, I, I think it's it's an interesting time to have the conversation in a good way. I, I do think that, you know, we, we had a series of challenges that I'm sure that members would have wanted to talk to them about in the pre-COVID world, but now's a good time to talk to them about their plan for recovery in a way that ensures transport is sustainable into and out of the borough. Thank you very much. Unless I don't think anyone else wants to come back in. Um, Councillor Sergeant has a raised hand at the moment. Is that uh, okay? Previously, yeah. Councillor, you're muted. I'm afraid. Sorry, Anne. That was the last one. Oh, was was, okay. one. I'll lower it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everyone very much for joining the meeting and I, I'm sorry Jane... councillor is it possible to just endorse the work program as is so the recommendation that we have do we need to vote on that yes just a final endorsement that we the, oh, sorry the, apologies. apologies that's absolutely fine um the, the the committee uh considered and endorses the items for inclusion in its work program thank you very much Jan. uh councillor gordon oh, i'll vote for that one i think thank you Councillor Fellows? I'll vote for it. Uh, Councillor McGurran's also voting for it. Uh, Councillor Sargent? Mute. Councillor Sargent? Would you like to register a vote, please, Councillor Sargent? I think Councillor Sargent's muted at the moment. Yeah, well, I'm trying to explain yeah, that. Yeah, I was muted. I, I was muted and it, the button, I've got the other one. Yes, I'm going to vote for it, Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lawrence? Oh. Thank you very much. A unanimous one. That makes a very pleasant change. Thank you. Um, just like to say uh, thanks, everyone, for attending tonight. And I'm genuinely pleased to see everyone looking well at the moment. Uh, hope you all stay safe and well going forward uh, and thanks very much obviously in terms of the July meeting we'll sort out a date we'll let you know but thanks very much for your engagement this evening it, it is appreciated thanks a lot good night thanks. have a good evening everyone good night. Bye.